Lee from Monstrosity, and you're listening to the Phantasm Podcast. Phantasm. This is Leo from Cut Up. What's up, motherfuckers? This is Brian from Vital Remain. This is Lee from Monstrosity. Hey, this is Morgan. My name is Suffocation. Hey, this is Tom Clark from Morris Hollow Ground. This is Dallas and Allen. You're listening to Phantasm Podcast. This is Dr. Ross Stewart from Exhumed and Impaled, and you're listening to the Phantasm Podcast. Phantasm. What the fuck is up? And welcome to the Phantasm Podcast. I am Corey Gore Christ. With me, Dr. Motherfucking Vincent West. Hey, hey, hey. What's going on? We're fired up and ready to fucking go. We are ready. Uh, we just... Did an awesome interview with uh, Lee Harrison, a monstrosity that's coming up for you guys later. Yep, uh, killer fucking interview. Uh, goes right into the to the meek of uh, of uh, death metal and the history of it. Uh, the guy's a fucking legend. Monstrosity, great shit, great band. Monstop, monstrosity's top tier fucking death metal, definitely essential. Um, if you don't have any of their shit, I don't know why you listen to this podcast, but. You need to start uh, grabbing some of that stuff. Yeah. So. Speaking of which, this is this is Doctor Vincent West. This is a podcast. <laughs> I had to do it. I don't know. Do it. <laughs> uh, this, this is Corey Gore Christ, and it's a podcast. What's it? <laughs> this is fun. Anyway, that was a throwback to an episode that you have already listened to, hopefully with uh, some other friends of ours in uh, Gorgasm. Such uh, a such a killer episode. It was super fun. Those guys were. Just a, uh, just hilarious dudes, man. They they know how to have a good time. So, uh, knocking them out though, kids. We've got uh, Lee from Monstrosity. Yeah, that's that's huge for us. I think huge fans. Um, very personal interview. It's yeah, it's it's cool, man. It, very dark it, kind of. It, it gets into a lot of the 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 chronology of uh, of of death metal. Really, just just from him talking and sharing his his. Uh, you know, story of the band and and where it's gone from start to finish, and you know where it is now. So, uh, really fucking cool interview uh, we got for you guys coming. But right now, of course, we we, we can't be phantasm without giving you the horror and the death metal. So, uh, Doctor, what what do we have for them today? We have the 1990 Tom Savini Not a Living Dead, which I love. They came to pay their respects. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Why do you have to be so cruel? What? Show some respect. Now, they're running for their lives. A biologist in Stockton, California have released reports focusing on the phenomenon, specifically on that trance-like state. Every shelter is becoming a trap. Are you sure we're going to be all right? And every road out. Don't stop no matter what happens. Is just another dead end. They're coming right for us. George Romero's Night of the Living Dead. Actually, uh, and the doctor brought this to my attention, this is the first zombie film we've done. Yeah. And he, I'm real picky. I do enjoy zombie films. I'm just real picky about them. I mean, I, I was more into zombies growing up when it was newer to me. Now that it's kind of... Uh, it's mainstream. It's oversaturated. You know, this movie's not, though. No, no one knows the fuck. Your favorite is. one, which I'm not going to mention right now that we will be doing on a later episode... That is definitely, as popular as it is, it's still not oversaturated. It's great. Return of the Living Dead. Yeah, it's great. I mean, you ask any average uh, Walking Dead fan or... They don't know what this is. Anybody that's got a, a magnet sticker on the back of their car that says, I heart zombies they don't or know what, it what is. the fuck ever or a zombie killing permit or some they shit on their is. car, you ask them, hey man, have you seen Return of the Living Dead? No. Have and if they seen, have, they've definitely not seen this one. Have you seen Night of the Living Dead, the remake, 1990? No. No. They don't I mean, I, I actually haven't seen this before. You're going to love this. This will be something you end up buying. 
Uh, we're watching my Twilight. I thought Tom I have. Copy. I swore I had this on DVD because I remember the the logo. It's my Twilight Time copy, kids. Very rare. Very expensive. Oh yeah, this you, thing's over a hundred bucks. Yeah, now. this this thing you're gonna have to get on eBay. We're we're watching the Twilight Time Blu-ray, super fucking limited. You can get a nice import of this off Amazon for eighteen bucks. That I'm told doesn't look quite yeah. as good as this. Let me. Uh, some confusion with this. There's a Euro boot also of Christine and Fright Night, which I do not recommend buying because Christine has actually been released domestically by Sony. I also have the Twilight oh, Time of it, but already just like the. The classic we got here. Yeah, the, the makeup in this again. I'm not trying to you know look as nuts, but I uh, actually I don't know that Tom did the makeup in this. I think K and B did, right? Which actually is probably why it looks even better. I don't know, but the zombies in this look good. He looks great. But uh, we got Johnny is played by Bill Mosley in this film. Yep, which a lot of the. Uh, Corey's a huge Bill Mosley fan. I'm actually looking at a Bill Mosley autograph right now. It says to Corey, my number one fan, Bill Mosley. No, it doesn't. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, he he likes. I him do okay. have the autograph. I like him okay too. He's he's okay. He's been in a lot of horror shit. He was a buns to me when I met him, but you know whatever. Yeah. He was nice to Corey. <laughs> uh, Toodle, Corey's dog is going to rip his nuts off at the next con we go to. <laughs> he's going to have. He's going to be ballless. He's like, I'm no, I'm kidding. I'm the number one. I'm kidding. Fan. He's fine. It was weird. I think he was just having a cranky day. He was bad mood or something. But uh, yeah, Barbara is now walking, as you know, through at like the original, even though this is the remake, which I prefer. Uh, she's running back to her Volvo and getting in it and getting the hell out of there. Although she's running back to could, her or Mercedes. Excuse me, Mercedes. She's running and, back uh, in her Volvo. This is an interesting shot. This guy is straight nudie. Oh. Something Corey didn't need to see. Zombie hairy ass. Uh, hairy zombie ass. Before. And now he's ripping off his nudes because he's standing on his clothes. He's coming, so to, get, he, he's the, coming uh, to get you, Corey. The, the case for that. They're coming to get you, Corey. Uh, so uh, I'm going to go back to the film here, kids. I know I got away from it on the last film that we did, and I apologize. I am back in form. Uh... Demon Knight was just kind of there and it was on while we were rambling. But anyway, not going to do that to you today. Barbara's running through the goddamn woods. She just fell in the woods. She looks like a man, but she's not. She does I'm look sure like a man. Is. She does. She's not very attractive. And she here comes some those, zombies. Uh, she likes those naked zombie buns. Uh, want to talk about a, an aspect while she's running through the woods here from the zombies. I wanted to talk about something about this film that a lot of people complained about this release. Uh, Tom Savini went in with the cinematographer and they put a blue hue on this film. Mm -hmm. I like it. The goddamn thing with it, without it, excuse me, without the blue hue, it's way too brightly lit. Mm -hmm. Not too brightly lit. Like fucking Tales from the Dark Side. But seriously, <laughs> it, it uh, I like the blue hue. And what's funny, Twilight Times like, well, we'll refund your money, send them back, and all these fanboys are like, I don't like it, but I'm going to keep it. <laughs> It's like, well, if you don't like it, then send it back so somebody else can buy it. They never did that. I got my copy uh, off Amazon. When, okay. when, for so like 40 it? bucks. Barbara is now trying to get in the home, which they will be spending a large period of time in in this film. I like this film. It's gory. It's nasty. Uh, what do you think of the uh, blue hue on this? I like it. I do, too. Uh... The damn film is too fucking... Let me see that. It's pretty cool. You can tell that he did that because, you, you know, for obvious yeah, reasons. Yeah, it's interesting. But, um... It looks like you did it off your computer, but... <laughs> yeah. Uh, or on my phone. Um, Just to let you know, the proceeds off that Night of the Living Dead that's $18 on Amazon goes to Corey's bank. <laughs> he, he owns it the also copy goes to the out. It also goes to the spine of my... Uh, Knight Rider Blu-ray case that uh, Tom Savini <laughs> tried to destroy. But he would have thrown this at me, too. You know what? Um, Remember, I about sent this with you. Yeah. Going going back to that time, and if, you know, it's been a while since I mentioned this, I think the last episode I maybe touched on this was Pieces, or maybe we got into it in another episode. Um, Eli Ross Reese's Pieces, for you guys that haven't watched this episode three, it's fucking great. 
we stayed up all night doing that fucking episode. Yeah. Um, Watch Blind Date, too. Find it. Yeah, we did with uh, Nikolai. It was fucking funny. Um, I was at Mad Monster in March uh, with Alexis, my girlfriend, and uh, the first guy I went up to meet was, was Tom Savini. And, and I, there's a hand on I had brought uh, Knight Riders with me, the Scream Factory. I fucking love that film. It's weird that I like it, but I love it. Um... You know, and there's a, there's a zombie uh, stage dive, and he just, oh, that was pretty awesome. That's a pretty scary zombie too. Um, anyway, these look good. <laughs> Tom Savini had just got, you know, I was at a convention or whatever, so he he just got back to his table. He downed like a fucking a whole like was he drinking liquor? Yeah, he had a whole glass full of like whiskey or something or scotch or something. <clears throat> And he was already pissed off because I was standing there waiting on him. To... Were you the only one there? Yes, I was the only one standing there. There's nobody table. else. He, he was next to... Oh, shit, he's fucking carjacked. This movie's good, man. Um, Blue Hue. He, I was the only one standing at his table. Right next to his table was George Romero against the wall, who was obviously backed up for fucking miles. And... I went to Tom Savini first, and I really wanted to uh, see if he had any Morgan prints from Knight Riders because I was that was one of the main things I had. You know, Tony I, Todd. Yeah, Tony Todd, fucking Candyman's on screen. He's playing the uh, guy that got shot in the head at the end. I don't remember the characters' names from that movie, but um, it's very tragic. You know, the black guy lives, and then they think he's a zombie because he's so tired, and they shoot him in the fucking head. Whatever. Um, so I walked up to Tom. I was fucking at his table. I was waiting on him to sit down. And he was already cranky because I was standing there waiting on him. And, uh, you know, I was like, hey, man, it's nice to meet you. And he just, like, shook my hand. And he was like, okay. So already I was like, I should just turn around and go away. But fuck him. I'm not going to. Uh, at was, what point did you hand him money? After everything. Okay. I should have just walked off and be like, you're not getting my money. But So you knew then he was already an ass. Yeah, because I was like, hey man, it's it's great to see you again. You know, and he was like, okay. You know, immediately it's like, this isn't going to go well. So, but I let it go. I was like, maybe he's just got to work out his cranky. I don't know what what happened this morning or he, you know, what, what the fuck's going on. So I handed my Knight Riders Blu-ray, and I'm like, hey, I love this movie. It, it sucks you don't have any Morgan prints with you, because I really wanted a, a Knight Riders print for you to sign also. And he just, like, he signs the Blu-ray, just ignores everything I was saying. And then he, like, slams it a few times, like it's, he's packing a deck of cards, and then just hands it to me. He's like, here you go. And I was like, I thanks and then he was like pay the nice lady right there and then I gave her 20 bucks and then walked off and that was that I immediately went over to the staff of, of Mad Monster and I had them cancel my uh, pre-ordered ticket for the sex machine photo op and I switched it with uh, Malcolm McDowell's photo op so which is a smart move anyway so he can eat my Legend he, can eat, he can eat my balls I paid 10 more dollars to get a fucking uh, <laughs> Clockwork Orange backdrop with Malcolm McDowell and my girlfriend. It was fucking sweet. Uh, she fucking hates From Dust Till Dawn anyway. She thought she thought that movie was a turd because it is a turd. Um, it's a Robert Robert Rodriguez turd. Yeah, not the first one. He's he's made nothing but turds in his career except for uh, Planet Terror was pretty cool. I didn't like it. Um, but he's still a fucking hack. I mean, he's he ruined Predators for me. That movie. That's the first movie I ever walked out on in theaters. Uh, I actually stood up and stood there for a minute. And I was like, okay, yeah, this is terrible. Uh, yeah, it's a piece of shit. So that's all. You know, I, I like From Dust Till Dawn sometimes, but for the most part, it's just weird. And, you know, uh, Quentin Tarantino's a rapist. Just remember, he directed Spock Kids. We're talking about the same fucking guy. Yeah, exactly. He's like, I gotta, have it. I gotta suck Antonio Banderas' dick and put him in every movie. Only yeah. movie he ever did that I liked was Desperado. That's it. Yeah, that's and it. El Mariachi was pretty cool, but I can't Desperado. Can't do it. Do it live. <laughs> Desperado is his best movie. So, anyways, let's go back real, real, real quick. I'm going to reiterate this. So, yeah, I, we're already going off the rails. You can see where this episode's going, but no, no, uh, it's fine. 
you know. We're fine. I'm on point. We're, so we're Tom, in the house. We're good. So Tom was a total fucking rump. And uh, I don't... Well, you fixed it. You switched it to Malcolm, and, and there you go. Yeah, and then I walked over to George, and I was like, what's this deal? I was being a butt. He's just like, ah, you know, stuff happens. I was like, well, thank you for signing my Blu-ray, George. Some people you meet, and, you know, I had, I had met Tom a few times before, and he was really nice to me, so I don't know what the deal was. Uh, I got trapped in, the mount, in an elevator. He didn't you know, like stuff your face. Stuff like that. I guess not. He was like, <laughs> he was like you know what, if, if, <laughs> if you don't change your face, I'm going to have to change it for you. <laughs> and I was like, all right, man, I just really like Knight Riders. He was like, hey, that's great, man, you know, but I really just don't like your face. You're just going to have to back up. You know? I don't know what he did. But, you know, it's, it's... He was mad before he sat down. I feel like if I was somebody else... With like a From Dust Till Dawn Blu-ray, he would have acted the same way. I just he looked pissy. I shouldn't. I should have left him alone when I walked up to him. But I was like, I had just got to the convention. I was ready to go. You know, the hotel. You know, I, I was in the hotel staying where the convention was. But you know, I was out and about and stuff. So when the convention started, I was ready to go. He was the first guy I wanted to meet, and you know, I was like, "Oh, I, I want this Night Rider sign." He probably thought I was some schmuck. I was going to sell on eBay and all this stuff, and I was like, "Maybe I should now," you know. But the only reason I refused to actually sell it because a, I don't do that. If I'm going to get an autograph from you, it's not to put it online. It's right. because I fucking want it. It's for me. I'm not paying the money to make money, you know. But the only reason after that I did not sell it is because a, no one's going to buy Night Riders with Tom Savini's, you know, uh, autograph on it. It's not worth a damn thing. I'll tell you that. His autograph's not worth shit. It's worth 20 bucks at a convention. You know how much that's worth on eBay? Nothing. So, I got George Romero's autograph on it because he actually appreciated the fact that I even liked that movie. I think Tom Savini, like, hates that movie because it was such a pain in the ass to film. But, I mean, that was, besides Martin, that was, like, his starring role movie that he should have appreciated but i really don't think he does you could have walked up with maniac and he would have thrown it at you i mean i don't know yeah <clears throat> or, or the, this he directed this he probably would have shit all over this too yeah it doesn't matter like, i was initially gonna send you with this you're, like, you're a fucking yeah. asshole for having me sign this you're gonna sell on ebay it's like your signature is not worth a damn thing it doesn't matter i'm about to walk over and get george romero's autograph that's fucking worth money because i'm paying yes, a hell is. of a lot to get it but that's why i wouldn't get rid of my night riders because i'm not gonna let tom savini ruin it because i like that movie and I, li- and I like it for George. I think he really, tr- you know, I like Ed Harris. And I got George to sign it too, and that's why I wouldn't sell it because it's got his stamp on it. So, And I know George appreciates anybody who watches that movie and likes it. So, Because it was in between Dawn and, and Day, and he just tried something different. Yeah, it's good. And it's a good movie. I know he, he wasn't really as self conscious about it as, as Tom was doing it because. You know, George just wanted to try something different, and he didn't really give a fuck if anyone thought it was stupid or not. And it originally wasn't going to have motorcycles and all that stuff. It was actually going to be horses, but they thought it was a pain in the ass. So they just were like, fuck it, let's use motorcycles. And they made it something cool, you know. But, uh, you know, <clears throat> that whole experience didn't bother me. I'm glad it happened first thing, and I got it out of the way, and I had fun with the rest of the convention. I didn't have any other issues with anybody, so. Uh, but for all you convention goers or maybe you first timers don't let somebody's stupid attitude uh, bother you especially if they're going to try and ruin the spine of your blu-ray you pay 30 bucks yep. for plus 20 of it for an autograph you know um, just just leave them alone just let them be pissed off at whatever's going on if that's how they're going to act and they'll figure it out Corey's eventually. favorite thing just to let you all know at that convention <clears throat> was getting to meet the cast and director of his favorite horror film, Mutilator. <laughs> it's it's so gory and and amazing. I'm quoting uh, a friend of ours that I won't name, Jens Platt. And that was it. That was the highlight of his. Those guys were really nice. Trip. You know, they were super cool. Um, Corey's actually the killer in Mutilator Two, which is going to be in 3D this okay. fall at a theater near you. And it's called Fall Break 2 for those of you that just want to be edgy and have two titles to a movie. Because they didn't even rate it the first time. They're like, we don't even have a rating on this movie. Not because it's, it's, you know, it's 
so uh, gory and stuff, but because we just don't even want to rate this film, it doesn't need to be in theaters. To get into the My Mutilator thing, <clears throat> there was such a build-up from our friend Jens about that turd. <laughs> and, I, and I wasted, and I'm mad about it still, I wasted $30 on that piece of shit. <laughs> and it's not worth the paper it's printed on. It's the worst piece of dog shit I've ever seen. And I don't give a fuck if Arrow paid me to review it, I wouldn't review it. <laughs> it's a piece of shit. But well, anyway, back to Night of the Living Dead. They're in the house. <clears throat> the the uh, farmer zombie shit's is escalated <clears throat> quickly, dead. Yeah. And See, Tony that, Todd is going through the kitchen and looking for weapons the and windows and food and whatever they need. Preserves. <clears throat> Yeah, this is this one's escalated a lot quicker than the old film, definitely. Um, the only the only thing that the old film escalates into is going to bed. Yeah. <laughs> Real quick. When I was younger, watching this, it was it was trying to. Did you pull up? The, do we have anything on the? In the middle of this movie, um, my phone's oh, my, toast. Minus two, because you know, it's like fantastic. Um, Stays is getting better and better. Hey, come here. But when I was watching, you know, the old movie when I was younger, in between the movie and the ending of the movie, I was trying to figure out uh, which bunk I should sleep in. Oh, really? Usually within like ten minutes I was asleep. No matter it's what. pretty, yeah, it's pretty bad. Even in the middle of it, you know. Now granted I was saying to the doctor earlier, uh, the original Night of the Living Dead, it's a staple to horror it's like the Black Sabbath of horror movies, not the movie Black Sabbath, but the band. It's like what Black Sabbath is to death metal or metal in general. Night of the Living Dead is that to horror movies. But yeah, agreed. The original, yeah. It's also at the same time, it's, <clears throat> it's a very uh, just dirgy. It's just a. It, it just makes me want to go to bed. That's all. Yeah, kind of like me with Black it turns Sabbath. turns me into an actual zombie watching. <clears throat> Same with Black Sabbath. For me, it just makes me want to go to sleep. Yeah. Ozzy Osbourne era Black Sabbath. No thanks. <laughs> I just want to go to bed. So, uh, you know, I'm This into, song's been played too much. Fun <laughs> I'm into stuff, have, you know. <clears throat> Ronnie James Dio owns my soul. Fun <clears throat> I'm just. Give me Dio this. any day, kids. <clears throat> <laughs> Give me Dio. No Ozzy Osbourne. Shit. Just Dio. I'm just into, uh, you know, faster paced movies. I just can't. Can't do it. This movie's good. I, I think it has a good pace. I like pace. the pace it's, of this already. Cause it's, it's gory. Stuff's going on. I love like, Tony oh, Todd. I'll take this over Candyman. I just like this movie. Candyman's pretty awesome. Can't, I can't do it. Can't do it? I can't do it. You don't like Candyman? Nope. We'll do it live. <laughs> that is one I will not be doing with you. Is it just... I just, think it's, I, just think it's, I just think it's a turd. It's not him. It's not Tony Todd. It's I think it's shitty writing on Clyde Barker's part. I just think it's a stupid story. And mm. I'm this guy that haunts this fucking you know, bathroom. Yeah, it's like I don't care. I, I haunt a urinal. <laughs> I, I, I haunt a urinal at a fucking at a fucking I'm gonna hook apartment your, complex. I just don't. I'm gonna hook your. I'm gonna hook off your wee wee in the urinal. <laughs> <clears throat> I can't. I don't know. I can't do that one. I don't. Oh, shit. Isn't there like four of them? I've only seen. The yeah, first it's one. he's in like I think two of them or something. That's, That's weird. And Scream Factory put out that Farewell to the Flesh or whatever, which yeah. is a turd. <laughs> I just don't. I don't know. I don't. Claude Barker for me is is not breed and Hellraiser, and that's it. Oh, I don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't go into other places. I don't know if you we have any 360 owners out there or anybody that owned a 360. Clive Barker's video game that they made was a fucking turd. I never played that. It was a fucking turd. <laughs> Clive Barker should Can't just stick to it. writing books, I guess, man. I mean, that's whatever he wants to do. I think he just stamped his name on the video game. I don't know if he wrote one. Did he that write game the video was, game? I think so. Was it like Tortured Phil? Yeah, it was or Yeah, or it was something. It was horrible. I remember the toys there, the McFarlane toys were pretty cool. Whenever... No, it wasn't called torture. It was called something weird. But it was like a first-person shooter, and you're out hunting stuff. What? Look it up. <laughs> I can't do it. Look it up. Look up 360. Still alive. Fuck I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's bad. But, uh, but yeah, you know, this film, 
saw it at the theater, skipped school to see it. Most of the horror movies I saw as a teenager, I would skip school and go watch them, which I'm very proud of. Don't do that. It's not good for your... Get loaded. ...for your uh, career. Please, please skip school to watch horror. Well, you know what? There also no, there's nothing good to skip horror, to skip school for anymore, so... It was back then. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Don't don't skip school. Don't for, skip school uh, to go watch the new Ghostbusters. You know? Yeah, or for teeny bopper horror stuff. Just uh, Star Trek Footlong. Might as well go to school so you can grow up and make better movies. You know what I mean? Right. So let's see. So for this, Romero rewrote the original screenplay. Oh, okay. The John Russo screenplay. She's a very nice guy. They're both nice guys. You met John Russo as well. I did. At the same convention. I met him at Guarbecue, which is weird. He was just there with a booth at Guarbecue last weird. year. Weird. Yeah, and I was like, John Russo? Hi. He was like, hey, man. He was, I was like, you're a fucking legend, man. This is really cool. I didn't expect you to be here. And he, he was like, well, it's it's good to see you, and, and thank you for coming to say hey to me, whatever, blah, blah. Circuit to March this year, and there he is again. And he's he's just a nice guy, right he's across. Following from, you around, right across, right across from George, and then you got Tom in the middle of it, you know, being a rump. So <laughs> it was it was pretty cool. Um, I I don't know. You got any any rump stories? Have you met Tom Savini before? No. Okay, that's probably a good thing. You know, I don't. I, I honestly, as many uh, musicians as I've met, I've I've kind of shot away from actors and. Yeah, people. I don't know. I don't. I don't really do that. And honestly, it's 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 been something that uh, I normally avoid because I don't want. I'm so into movies that I don't want that ruined. Yeah. Not that it doesn't suck when it is with a a band, you know, because then you don't want to give them any money either, and I don't if they're mean. But but it's it's, it's really if, sucks with an actor. That's one thing if they're a band, but. If it's an actor, you have to see their face the whole movie. I mean, I can give I can give you an example. Of something that happened to uh, to Julia. She and I had went to a convention, and Julia wanted to meet Elvira, and I thought she was a cunt. <laughs> I didn't have anything against her. I'm not a fan, but I don't hate her either. I just don't care. The only the only thing Elvira that I like are her old pinball games. Yeah. Which, if y'all have the one of those pinball like download DLC things for the either your PS4 or the Xbox One, there's some Elvira pinball things, and it's exactly like what I used to play in the arcade. They're fucking cool, nice. but she was just she. I don't know how to describe this other than I, I will do it here for the audience. Uh, while Tony Todd is discovering other people in this house, and I'll they're hiding to the in movie. the cellar this whole yep. time. Yep. Uh, you got Harry Cooper and it Alan was kind of like and Thera. Julia's trying to talk to Elvira, and all she got to communicate with Elvira wouldn't even look at her. All she wanted to do was talk to her handler, and the handler would answer her. It's like she speaks. She's fucking from America. It's not like she. Needs she was speaking it. through the handler to Julia. It was really rude. Yeah, it's just. Yeah. And it was also overpriced. I wouldn't have given her five bucks to, for a fucking picture, much less what Julia gave her, which was something like sixty-five or seventy. It was yeah. something ridiculous. Uh, like I said, I, I've had nothing honestly but bad experiences up until this year of going and meeting people that I have liked since I was young. Normally, it's a really bad experience. Unbelievably, this last time that I went to a convention which was not horror related. When I met the three people that I did, it was all really positive. Well, that's good. That's what you want. But you know. normally, i got to be honest with you, I would tell you guys not to go. Because normally my experience has not been that. It's been negative. Right. Uh, these people are angry or they're embarrassed, I think, that they're, they're asking for money. Uh, I've never had anybody... I, I've been really lucky. I've never had anybody just out and out be mean to me. All the people that I've ever chanced on have been like Dick Dick Warlock that played uh, Swamp Thing in the television show and in the in the two feature films. Uh, very nice. Yeah. Very cool guy. You know, the couple, a handful of people that I've, yeah, I'm trying to think of people that are horror related. Uh, Dirk Benedict that I met. Dirk was uh, face on the A team. Nice. And he was Starbuck on. Uh, uh, Battlestar, the original Battlestar Galactica, the only Battlestar Galactica. It was not that piece of shit remake. <laughs> um, Starbuck is a dude; it's not a chick. Anyway, uh, very cool. You know, so I've been lucky, but 
Again, I haven't yeah, really, I haven't to. done what you've done. I've never really not trying to stray you guys away from definitely if dived you, into if, that. If you want to, I will stray you away from. If it. you want to do it and and take you know, if that's what you want to do, you know, then then go do it. Don't do it. Means. I would. But I don't chance it. I've only had like a couple of bad experiences out of all the times I've went to conventions. So It's a gamble. Yeah. It's like walking in and buying a goddamn scratch if I think. I really do. Right. You don't know what you're going to get. And in something on some of the ones I've done, it was a real big gamble because you, you give someone over 50 bucks, uh, you don't know what you're going to get. You yeah. just don't. I mean, look what you got with, there you go. I mean, and you went into that before. You got fucking ripped. That was like, I don't even know how much it was. You got ripped. It's just, I mean, that's not right. And that's why I tell people, I will tell people the complete opposite. I would, uh, the hell? Stop listening. Sorry, goddamn uh, Xbox, Xbox is, is fucking uh, peeping. My Xbox is needy. But yeah, I, you know, it's one of those things where it's like... Uh, I think, though, it's worth it if you're paying... Yeah, if you want to do, if you do, I'm just saying, I'm very negative on that. I don't, For I'm me, not real... before you get stuck there all weekend... And you've never uh. you've never gone to a convention, then um, I would just go for one day. Don't go. Don't book your. If you've never been to a convention, don't book yourself the whole fucking weekend to be stuck there if you don't know what you're in. Don't for. pay for a sex machine. Yeah, don't pay Love for a sex pack. machine photo op like eight months before the show. You might not want to do it. Um, you got lucky getting that fixed. Yeah, I did. Um, it's mostly been good. Nine, you know, ninety-eight out of a hundred percent has been good. So, I mean, it all depends on the people that are there, what's going on with them. I mean, you don't fucking know. So, if you want to go meet people and try it out and and risk, you know, losing money and maybe uh, credibility or, uh, you know, because will I will I f- ever forget the way Tom Sabini treated me? No. Does it override everything that he's done up until that point? Yes. Like, was he nice to me before that? Yeah. But was he nice to me last time? No. Well, it also, if you're like me, it makes you look at things different. Like, like I love this movie. But when I watch the but original... I'm not, but I, but I'm, I'm going to have a lot easier time now in the reverse of this. If I was you, I couldn't watch this right now. Yeah. Well, it's different if he's behind, if he's in a director's chair than if I were to watch Dawn of the Dead and I want him to fucking... Let's give Corey a round of applause... <laughs> For uh, actually, watch. see, I'm not being a smartest. I'm serious for actually watching this because I will tell you this: if he had done what he did to, if he'd done to the doctor, what he did to Corey, uh, this would have bitch. This movie wouldn't. We wouldn't be watching it. Be on eBay. That's how I roll. So you're a you're a bigger person than I am. Y'all should listen to Corey and not me. Uh, the doctor is unforgiving. Well, I'm just saying it's one thing if he's behind the director's chair, but if if you were like, let's watch Dawn of the Dead on Blu-ray, which is also rare and fine, then uh, I would be like, well, I just want him to crash on his fucking motorcycle. You know? Sure. I don't want to watch him. I couldn't watch that Night Riders movie anymore. No. But I'm stuck with it because I'm not going to sell it because... You know, I respect. No, 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 no. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just telling you. But yeah, I wouldn't watch it anymore because you know. it's. I don't want to see his face. So I didn't even look at it the rest of the weekend. I did that day one, and then I was like, "Well, there's him. I'm just going to go back over here." You know. So you know, but him and weird. He's got a Steelers hat on. Yeah, they were up in Pittsburgh. You know, where the original one was set and filmed, <coughs> which is cool. Actually, it was supposed to be in Kentucky, wasn't it? But it wasn't. I don't know. I'm gonna grab. now. That was uh, that was Return of the Living Dead. They made it in Kentucky. Or some shit. Do a little research on this while we're watching it. Hopefully, my phone. <laughs> Guys, uh, we got a hell of an interview coming up. Lee Harrison. Yeah, so much fun. Uh, a lot of insight. A lot of history of death metal. Bands, monstrosity. Great guy. I uh, hope you enjoy it. It's really fucking cool. Uh, Get into some pretty cool stuff. He, we, I'm really happy, uh, and I apologize if I've, <coughs> excuse me, dropped the ball on this in the past. Uh, we went through every fucking release. Yeah. Lee started with the demo. We went all the way up to Spiritual Apocalypse, and then the new record, which is yet to be uh, released. But uh, right. you get to hear more about that. Uh, and back to Tony Todd, looking at this crazy fuck. Uh, 
that uh, was in the basement with his... It's Harry. Whoever, yeah. Well, she looks like Harry from the old film, but it's not, obviously. They did a good job with this. I mean, like I said, it's... It's very true to the original. Um, it practically this movie's claustrophobic. Is. Yeah. It should be. It's good. I don't know why people complain about the, be- the blue hue thing. I mean, it's obvious why it's there. I mean, I have sunglasses on now, but the blue <laughs> hue doesn't bother me. I have my sunglasses on because uh, I like to wear them when I record. Yeah. But uh, but no, it's brought outside where we're at in beautiful Clearwater, Florida. <laughs> anyway, uh, back to the back to this. I'm going to look this up here. But uh, you got the zombified uh, daughter there. That's uh, very ill at the moment. It's a good movie. Eventually, hopefully, at least, of course, you see the the trowel scene that they reenact in this where. She stabs her mom or whatever. Which is but to go back to this again, I want to kind of touch on this for a second. I got the Candyman thing. Love Tony Todd. Love him as as Kern in, in Star Trek oh, Next yeah. Generation, uh, Worf's brother, the Klingon. Uh, but I can't do. He's also in Deep Space Nine, several episodes, which is fucking awesome. Uh, one episode where he plays the aging uh, Jake Sisko. Huh. One of my favorite episodes in season four. But but anyway, what I was going to say, get on, off that, I'm sorry. Uh, Candyman, I don't know, man. I, I don't like the female in that film. Yeah. I can't think of her name. I can't stand her. <laughs> I like to run over with my car. Uh, I don't like the way the film flows, and I think it's a shitty story. Yeah, it's kind of borrowed from a lot of it's not him. stuff. It's not him. It, Tony Todd's fine in it. It's not even that. It's just I don't think it's a good movie. And it's people are like, hey, fucking candy. It's like people come up to me going, like, fucking saw. It's like, nah, I can't do it. <laughs> you know, if that's what you're into, that's great. That's fantastic. Can't I do, do it. If, if you have some kind of nostalgia piece to it, it's the same people. Uh, I saw a news piece today of, of the Olympians uh, were fussing because they didn't have Pokemon Go or something. Or And I'm what? like, I'm dead what? serious. The Olympians were fussing because wherever they're at, where the Olympics are, I couldn't even tell you, uh, they're, they they didn't have Pokemon Go, and they were upset about it. And I'm like, if that's all you have to get upset about, then... They're it, Olympians. Why are you even playing Well, I, I don't know, but apparently better, I'm the only person in a, in the world that does not play that game. But anyway... you got better shit to do. I, I do, and I'll, I'll kill you as a solid snake. But anyway... <laughs> uh, it, Whatever, I don't care if people like that or not. But where I'm going with this, it's kind of like Candyman. When Candyman came out, I remember it was at the theater and we saw it. There was all this hype behind it. It's a fucking hype machine. I just I have no interest in that. Was it that Virginia Madsen chick? Thank you. Like, I can't stand that's her. Doom. Yeah, I'm not a fan. Yeah, she, <laughs> I'm not a fan. It's like <laughs> she did the voiceover in that. She's the uh, sister of Michael Madsen. Uh, yeah, I'm not a big fan of his Which either. Which is crazy. Um. Now I'm going to give you guys some info on this film that we are watching. Here we go. All right, so... Or maybe not. Okay, here we go. Uh, This movie was released on... Oh, cool. It was released on October... 19th of 90, 92 minutes long. Uh, it barely made its budget back. Poor Christ is only a few months old. I'm not going to comment on how old I was. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. I'm going to put the fucking airbag on because I'm. Please, yes, I apologize. We had had to turn the air off earlier for the. Lee interview because we had to raw we like record the fucking thing. We had the first phone in. Usually we do uh, we do Skype calling, but uh, since we've had the internet down at the office over here, um, had to raw dog it. You know, our last we've been we've been pulling it off though, so it sounds really good. So either way. Um. <laughs> Re-up on my ginger ale because I'm 90. Okay, Savini did do the makeup in this. That's cool. It looks good. 
To avoid an NC-17 rating, Savini had to cut several scenes from the film. Didn't they originally get like an X rating? Uh, a Blu-ray version was released on October 2012, which is what we're watching. Limited to 3,000 copies. And Umbrella, the Australian film, released it in April of this year alongside the 1968 original. Okay. Uh, uh, very negative reviews. What a shock. Roger Ebert doesn't like a goddamn thing. You could, you could fart in his dinner with cash and he would hate the film. <laughs> That's just how it is. Uh, they're boarding up the doors to protect the house right now, and I'm going to go back to look at it this him, year. You can give him the bottom half of a hoker and give it to him on a silver platter, and he'd be like, this is... And you know what? I don't give a fuck, and I want to trash two sites here real quick, kids. I don't give a fuck what Rotten Tomatoes thinks of a goddamn thing. Yeah, look. Rotten Tomatoes like the new Star Trek film, which I wouldn't fucking wipe my ass on. It's so fucking yeah, horrible. Let, let me, let me give and you here's another, you another side yeah. I want to fucking attack real quick. Wait, wait, before you get Bloody on disgusting. Who fucking cares what you think? Let me give you guys a little message. If if, if you put... If a movie gets released and it says Rotten Tomatoes Fresh Certified on it, it doesn't mean I want to buy it. It just means, well, I probably don't want to watch this. So I just don't give a fuck what other people think. You know, this this is our, Corey and I's podcast. I I know I'm not interested in other people's opinions. If I offend you, blow me. The Bloody Disgusting's all right. Uh, I like how they incorporate... Not a uh, fan, kids. The doctor does not like it. They incorporate metal into their website, which a lot of them don't. Uh, usually that's... Wow, it sounds like us. Yeah, it does. But it's different. Not interested. Know, it's not the stuff we like, but, you know, they try. Y'all got that new fucking slip, not go see Saw 20. Anyway, not doing it. Uh, go see Lights Off. Anyway, uh, no, not doing it. Uh, so anyway, those sites are gay. Uh, <laughs> Rotten Tomatoes, bloody disgusting. You can blow me. Uh, not interested in what you think. I like this film. Uh, don't really care if anybody does or not. You know, we pick stuff that we like on here. Same with the monstrosity interview. If somebody out there thinks it's not relevant, again, you can blow me. Just unzip and insert into your mouth. Enjoy. Enjoy my penis. Uh, it's Canadian too, so it's lengthy. Right. But you know, I it's uh, this is good stuff, you know, and uh, you you move off of uh, off of uh, uh, you know a hype machine on something. This movie got no no support. Oh no, because they're also like, guys want the original. It's like, well, go watch the original. Savini apparently hated making this film. Yeah, just like he hates meeting Corey Gorkrist too. Yeah, he didn't like meeting you. It even says so. He was like, "Wow, I'd rather make." It says in March of 2016. (laughs) I'd rather worst thing could have ever happened. (laughs) I would have. When a Jewish troll came up to me with his copy of Night Riders as I slammed it on the table and threw it at him. I'd rather remake Night of Living Dead again than meet Corey Gorkrist again. We called you a Jewish troll, which I thought was kind of harsh. Yeah, his. It wasn't a real Blu-ray from Screen Factory either. It, it said Shout Factory. It was pretty sure it's bootleg. <laughs> okay. But no, but the the film, you know, this is... Is it great? No, but it, there's no zombie films that are really great, I don't think. I, I the, the whole idea of a zombie is, is what it is, you know? It's it's a, it's a paranoia thing. It'd be like a, a movie for me because I have a phobia of, of insects. It'd be like insects trapping me inside of a fucking home, you know? I don't know. You, you kind of work with what you have. This movie's claustrophobic, it's supposed to be, and it, it works on some levels, but it's, is this fucking the best movie I've ever seen? No, but I, I like it. I would definitely recommend buying it, especially if you like zombie films. It's entertaining, then it's good, you know? It doesn't have to be... Yeah, it's... And that's, that's Tom... Is this great? That's no. Tom Towles, isn't it? As um, But I will say this, at least Tom Savini's not out touring and making people listen to his awful band. Yeah, with his, you know... With his stepson, his son, his son's, uh, and then doing yeah. interviews on it with a comedian and blowing us off. Yeah, that's fine. You know, whatever. I'm not getting any more of my fucking money. Yeah, at least he didn't blow me off. He just was an asshole. It's kind of the same thing. Oh, I got, I got blown off. That's okay. We're not going to get that into that on here. But I, you know, whatever. I did last time. It's you know, it's 
People want to waste their money on stuff. That's their business. I just don't. Do it live. Fuck it. It used used to, it was fun for me to go out to a film or a concert or whatever else. And it still is. I still have fun when Corey and I and... Uh, we we go to a show and and we get to you know we do some stuff like like the the uh, hanging out with Dallas it was cool and Nile and, and doing all that but it was hard to enjoy the show when you're surrounded by a bunch of assholes you know it's 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 like anything else you know it's like we're going to see a movie tomorrow night and uh, Corey and I are and you know are there going to be a bunch of assholes that probably we're always seeing movies if I, yeah I can't like right now but it's always wow. but you know it's for some reason at a theater. It seems to be. It seems to be a little bit more controlled. It's you know like because I think they're like, well, I spent a lot of money. I need to be quiet. Well, no, it's because people are stationary and we're sitting in a seat. We're not standing in a venue where they can just walk up to you. Right. People feel less inclined when you're in your own personal space, sitting down, and you're vulnerable. It's a good fucking point. Whenever you're not vulnerable, it's a good fucking point. Yeah, and you're standing. Hell of a point. And you're standing watching a band. They think they have the opportunity. And the privilege to come up to you because you're standing where they're standing. But if you're sitting down in a paid seat, then they're not going to like walk up to you while you're sitting down because that's just that's that's an invasion of your personal space, and they damn well know it. But, right. I mean, that's a good point. If you're standing in a venue, they're going to walk right up to you and be like, "Hey, man," because there's right. no well, I can't, what happened to us. But it's uh, you know it's. It's a shame. I wish uh, I wish I could go to a concert or, and occasionally I can. But I will tell you guys out there, every fucking time we go to a concert, there is always some random asshole. Um, when we go and we go to a lot of shows in Atlanta, it never fails. We go to a lot of shows in uh, Miami and Orlando sometimes too, but. When we travel up, to, I visit friends and family in Atlanta. We go there a lot, and we go to shows there. And there's always some drunk, and he's he's always drunk. Or uh, I'm going to touch on our last one. We went to see uh, Vital Remains, uh, our last out of town show, and uh, we're hanging out with Brian, and which was awesome. What's up, Brian? Hope you're listening to these. Uh, anyway, and uh, from Vital Remains, and, and we were hanging out. And this, I, I swear to God, this fucking neo Nazi took a liking to me. A fucking neo Nazi. I'm dead serious. A truck driving neo Nazi. He walked up to me first thing, and I'm going to say this verbatim. Okay, this is this is me quoting. This isn't me from my words or anything like that. I'm I'm specifically quoting this person. I walked up to this guy, and he was in the middle of another conversation with somebody else. It was with Brian, wasn't it? No, this is after Brian walked off. He was talking to one of his buddies or something. And I walk up to, like, towards his direction, because we were just waiting around. We were wanting to talk to Brian. Watch Brian do the interview, yep. And uh, so I walk up towards his direction, and I overhear him talking. And... uh, Actually, you know what? This is actually the first thing he said to me. Okay, let's let's hear it. Okay, sorry. We got off no, the you're good. You're fine. I walk up to him, and I was like, "Hey, we've been driving for like four hours too, just to set this." Yeah, up. and I don't think he's from Atlanta. He's from like Alabama or some shit. No, he was from. He was from Atlanta. not originally, but he lived in that area. Yeah, because that was a local show to him. Because he liked like local mail. Well, I was like, you know, we came. I'm dreading seeing. Him I was again. like, we we had to pass through uh, Knoxville or whatever to get here because we were, you know, in the area at the time. And he was like, "Oh, this is verbatim." All right, so I'm not catching anything for this. This is what this guy fucking says to me. Neo Nazi okay. kids. He was, he was driver. like he was like Knoxville, Tennessee. Yeah, there's a bunch of niggers down there, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, I bet there's a bunch of niggers there. There's got to be. There's a, bit, a ton of niggers. Like, first sentence he says back to me, and that's what he says. So, already I have no interest in talking to this person, let alone I'm fucking Jewish, and I really don't want to be around this guy. Because right. first thing, I was like, only a neo Nazi is going to be that comfortable with racism around a complete stranger. Um, sure. You know. Well, he had if you if you remember, uh, he had some 
southern like clan stuff tattooed on I didn't even so, notice yeah uh, until yeah they were there until he started talking to me and rambling and I'm like fuck he's about it's to fantastic. like he's about to like shank me with his with his toothbrush right and then uh, I start looking around at him and you know I saw the tattoos and stuff and I was like Jesus Christ I just walked into a fucking brick wall we had to deal with this guy all fucking night too and actually he's uh, walking around he's trying to put his hand down the doctor's pants and he's just like you need to give me your information yeah he kept aggravating me I'm gonna rape I'm gonna rape you in the urinal he wanted a bootleg of this show that I had but we won't even get into that but what I will get into is this I literally the podcast the interview that you all got with Brian there is a point in that when I flat out fucking saved it because Corey was talking with Brian and I literally had to derail him. Do you not remember that? You like did like the, I had to you go did the action movie. Here. You did the goose. I had to go look like no seriously. I was like you were goose from Top Gun in that part. No, no, no. I, 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 I <laughs> only I you didn't it. die. No, I just I had to go over and be like I'm serious. I was like, look, you know, you well to me you, you like shut jumped, the fuck up. To me, you jumped in the way of a bullet. You, you shut were like, the fuck no. up because if you don't. You know, I, I don't want you walking because he was going to walk up and start asking him all these goddamn questions, even though we were standing there recording. Basically, where I'm going with this is, it's a fucking miracle that 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 didn't go to shit. Yeah, because I thought honestly at the time the whole thing was about to go in the toilet because y'all would have had a neo Nazi on there. Yeah, then I would be yeah. like, "Sorry, this episode is not airing." Cause... We would have never been able to put it up. But think, you know, I caught it, and I know you would have caught it too. But you were talking; you couldn't have ran off. I was the only one that was there. And actually, funny story: uh, Jens was supposed to be standing there, fucking keeping people away from us, and he's in there watching goddamn Hate Eternal, which I understand. But I wish he had, instead of saying, "Hey, I'm going to help y'all keep people away from you," he was in the goddamn venue watching the show. It's like I, you know, if you fucking told me. So I'm out there having to try to do the interview and and do security. It was fucking awful. Right. But anyway, I, and I'm probably have to fucking deal with that when I have another interview that I'm getting ready to do soon. But I'll tell you all about that another time. But uh, you know, it was just annoying. That zombie just got shot in the head by the the dog Barbara, chick. Yeah. Barbara. And anyway, but yeah, it was you know whatever. You know, we did it and it was cool, but. It wasn't cool having to deal with that guy. And that guy eventually, and he aggravated me all night till I gave him like my phone number, my email address. And what's funny is I changed both of them. Yeah. He was like, hey man, don't be messing with me on this. You got, like he's an This guy was addict really scary. Yeah, he was. And he kept talking about having to pay child support and how angry he was about it. It's just like, he was like, I'm, I, I'm, maybe I'm, you should have bought a box of condoms instead of a fucking six pack of strobe. Well, I feel, I, like, I feel like if you talked to him enough, he'd be like, well, I've been shopping some some assault rifles and I've been checking out some malls around the area. It's like, okay. Yeah, I mean, this guy was, this guy was crazy. definitely fucking running on empty. Yeah. I mean, he was not, there was not all there. I, I'm sure he's been in prison. The guy's probably got a record and everything else, but. Well, once he's Back said, to the film, the fucking girl, she's freaking out. Once he Tony said that, on her. that bullshit to me and just openly racist in front of me, I was like, yeah, that's, uh. Well, I mean, Look, you're going to get that, and it's a stereotype of metal, but those people do show up at shows well, like that. But you know what? Like that. Those same assholes show up at Kiss shows. They show up at fucking rock shows, ACDC. They show up at Aerosmith, whatever. They show up at anything because they're just white trashers. Like, I like my fucking white trash. They're like, like, we're racist, it. but we like everything. It's like, what? what well, it's not that? even that. They're just you they're just white like trash. That. I grew up around in that area down there. I know what it's like down there. You get fucking, you know, it's fucking... I never told those people I was Canadian. If I told that guy I was Canadian and fucking uh, a quarter Cuban, he would have fucking stabbed me in the stomach. He would have fucking prison stuck me fucking inside the show. Because he was scary. That's another thing you guys ought to hear about. We're trying to watch fucking Vital Remains and every time we'd stand there, he'd fucking walk by us and he's just like... And yeah, you remember that? He's fucking like, like fucking walking. jacked, yeah. He was like fucking, he's like, I, when I drink, I act fucking crazy. Of course, he's at the bar the whole fucking night. I'm sitting there going, yeah, oh, he, God. When we were outside and he was he was spouting off about his racist bullshit, uh, where he's, he thinks I'm on board with it, you know. He's just no, he like, thinks we were both down with it. He thought Corey and I and him he were was like, like best not, friends and we were going to start a band together. He and, was like, are you sure you got, are, are you sure you're not a kike? And I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure I what am. What is that? Not, I don't even know what that is. A Jew. Really? Kike, yeah. He said that to you? No, I'm just I'm making oh, fun okay. of him. I'm making fun of him. Like sweet Christ, if he'd said I that. I can say that word, you know, all day. But uh Um he, But know, he had some kind of a a German Oh yeah, I know, he's a queer iron not not the swastika, but he had some kind iron of a cross. Some or, kind of thing. Yeah. You know. 
That's the same thing. You know, it, whatever. I, I don't... Yeah, honestly, I'll be honest with you, I don't care. It doesn't offend If me. you're into that stuff. There's people listening to this and you like what we're doing and you want to do that. I don't give a fuck, honestly. I don't care. My whole thing was I don't want to hang out with this guy because... It wasn't even because he was racist. I had an issue with the guy because I think he was off. Period. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I, I mean, the racist thing is... No, I'm not condoning, but it's like I don't want the guy to fucking come up and stab me in the fucking neck during the middle of the show yeah. over a fucking... Well, here's what he was saying. Yeah, he was like, like talking about his child support thing, and then he was like... Uh, he was like, yeah, you know, uh, I don't... I'm, I'm better take it easy because I just got another DUI, and they're about to take my license, and... And the guy you know, power drinks to the whole yeah, fucking and, show. And he was like, I'm just not going to drink. You know, I've been, I've been doing really well, so I'm just trying to stay... Stay at ease here. Drank through the whole show. Yeah, and every time we saw him, he, he had like a twelve pack in his under his arm, you know, something like that. Well, no, he was just constantly. He's drinking bar. like a fucking fish. He was drinking know. liquor. It was exaggeration. Oh no, of course I agree. I, no, I'm with you, but yeah, he, he, he had he had a ke- fucking night. he had a keg strapped to his back like Pretty a pro- like a proton pack. Yes, he was just like. No, and you know that's fine, but you know you go to a show and do something like that. This guy was all well, you don't you walk know. up to strangers and, and drop n bombs and, and sure he does, and then and then, he does, and then be like, I better stay off of it because when I'm not, I, I get thrown out because I rip people's jaws off. Like he was telling us all this crazy shit. Either way, I, I tried to avoid him, try to be as nice as I could to him, as just because I didn't want to deal with him. Somebody gets drunk like that, and they you know, they will fucking they're causing the guy would have stabbed me, and we end up in the fucking ER stab. Not even that, he gets us thrown out because of some bullshit. He gets involved, and he's like, "Those guys are my friends." It's like I don't fucking know you, mm-hmm. dude. You know, those people will throw you under the bus in two seconds because that's what they want from you. Is yep, they're trying to talk to you and act like your buddies, yep. and then as soon as they get a chance, they're like, "No, it was them." It was scary. I mean, yeah. you know, whatever. I don't care. That in a situation fucking... like that, guys, just do your best to avoid them. Um, we can't avoid it. They're drawn to us for some reason. Yeah, Everything it's... The uh, best that you can do is just walk away. Just be like, see you, Junior. But uh, back to the movie, we got uh, Tony Todd in the basement throwing the old business fuck around. Tom Towels and Tony Todd are going at it. Yep, they're going at it. Well, she looks weird with hair because I'm used to him being bald. Tony Todd's fucking awesome in this movie. Yeah, he is. I think he gives a more powerful performance to the role of Ben, which I think his name is. Yeah, um, that sounds right. I don't know. Because you know, in the old film, he doesn't really talk or anything. He's just kind of there. It's <sighs> not much dialogue compared to this one. There's a lot more drama and well, you know, stuff going on. Because they're all cooped up in this tiny house, and you know, they don't know what the fuck they're doing. Because I mean, this shit just kind of fell in their lap, you know, literally. So, you know, sometimes remakes work. I mean, this is a remake that I like. There's it's remakes. a it's, it's a remake. The they don't. It's a know? remake by respectable people in the business, uh, including George himself, who rewrote the script. So I mean, they redropped it when they. It's it's the people that created. I can go. It. I can sit here and talk about some remakes that didn't work. Halloween. Halloween. That too. wasn't made by Carpenter, you know. So this was actually George Romero saying, right. "Hey, let's kickstart this again." I'm just saying. I'm. I can you list know. off. There's all kinds of remakes for me that don't work. You know, now they're apparently right. doing another Halloween film that John is producing, which I'm not a fan of because I think everything. I'll watch it. I mean, you know, I'll watch anything anymore. But after it's, Rob it's one of those Zombie things, took like, a shit on it, like I don't care about watching Halloween. I think that's all. I can watch the old ones all day; they're timeless. But Zob Rombie, yeah, Zob Rombie, but. The, <laughs> The old ones, are, the old ones are timeless, and the remakes are horrible. And everyone I talk to about it's just like, you know, you go to see him as a kid, and I was like, what is it with everyone wanting to see everyone as kids? Like, I could care fucking less. It's like I can care less about the first half of it. It's like I don't give a fuck. It's not even, you know, my I don't my I don't, thing I don't that, like going back to find out motives for anything. I would rather watch. It's scarier that Michael Myers just killed people. And if he was a disturbed kid that fucking snapped, like, you don't need to find out why. It's just scarier that you don't fucking know. I would rather watch fucking, uh, you know, any of the other Halloween sequels than watch his remakes. They're horrible. I'd rather watch Family Guy porn than watch that fucking... (laughs) Yeah, I mean, (laughs) it's just, uh, you know... It's him as a kid, not approved by John Carpenter, but, you know, it's like, what is this? But whatever John Carpenter's doing now with it, I don't know. It's, it's a cash grab at this point. It's, same thing with Jason. You know, I love new Jason movies. I, I like to see how they invent kills with them and stuff. But 
you know, this new one sounds terrible. At the same token, it's like when is it? Is it come out this year or next year? Probably next year. I don't see anything happening right now with it. Um, they would have already started teasing stuff. I think it's June of next year, Friday the thirteenth. Um, but let's find out, kid. It's not like everything's already been done or anything, but. With those characters, it has. There's nothing else they can do except for just keep remaking the same one movie or two first two sequels over and over and over. And, you know, everyone loves the characters, but everyone wants to, like, live in the past but see the same thing with different people. I don't I don't get that. I can watch... If I want to watch Friday the 13th or Michael Myers, I don't want more of it. I just want what I already have. I can be like, yeah, I want to see that shit. But, uh... You know, will I watch a new Halloween when it comes out? If it's not Rob Zombie or Eli Roth doing it, yes, I'll go watch it. And if it's, um, you know, Friday the 13th, if they make a new one, am I going to go check it out? Probably. I I went and saw Jason X in theaters, for Christ's sakes. I'm going to go watch whatever other one they put out. If I can sit through that in theaters and laugh my balls off, then I'll go watch the new Friday the 13th, whatever. (coughs) But I don't see anything in here about it. You know, am I going to be impressed, or am I, you know, I don't know. But I just don't need it, is what I'm saying. Is I'm completely okay with how many Jason movies and Freddy movies and all that shit that they made already. And I don't really... I'm not demanding anymore like a lot of other people are. Because I can watch the old ones and be perfectly fine with it. So, that's my two cents on that, so... Gore Christ out, folks. But I mean, I don't, you know... A lot of zombies right here. Looks like a chick. Um, I guess you know they're wanting to. They're they're always going to try to do a cash grab on something, especially slashers, because people aren't really trying to make new horror that's good, or even new slashers. And if they do, it's a rehash of. It's like, oh, it's a mix of Jason and, and Freddy put together. It's like, I don't care. You know. Come up with something new. It's not hard. It's like, look at my bloody Valentine. You just have a minor dude, like, hacking horrible. people up. Yeah, but the character, you know, the, the slasher's a cool idea, you know. Um, the movie's horrible. What's weird about those, those I, I'm actually glad you brought that up. I don't like the new one or the original. Yeah, they're really boring. Um Night of Living Dead, the original, runs marathons around how slow that one is. It's pretty bad. I mean, I, I, I went and watched it in 3D, the Mouth of the Valentine. The new one? Yeah. The new one's a fucking... And I went and horror. watched it. Yeah, it was horrible. Yeah, it's pretty bad. But I went and watched it, and everybody's like, this fuck good, <laughs> Rob man. Zombie was like, yeah, Rob oh. Tomatoes said it's good. Yeah, yeah. And Roger Eber gives it three thumbs up. Mm-hmm. You know. It's one of those things where it's like it was Terrible. interesting because I never I never understood we can pause it. Uh, I never understood why uh, I don't know. I, I guess I just never understood any of that. I don't understand how you know, people can think something that I love is garbage and they think all this other stuff that I think is garbage is great but so uh, people are completely different. Yeah. Because one person can be like, you know, uh, Season of the Witch is garbage, but I love those Rob Zombie movies. It's like, well, that makes sense. I've had sense. people tell me that. I know most most people tell me that. Like, I've never seen it, actually, but I'm going to tell you that it sucks. Well, you know, you get a lot of people that just think they're experts on everything, too. You know, they... They have no basis to back up anything that they're saying, but they're experts of everything. Look, we're not experts on everything we say, but, I mean, we're fans of all this stuff. We wouldn't do it if we weren't. So, I mean, our opinions are pretty validated based on what we have seen and what we like. I've been around a long time. I like to think some of my stuff's valid. If it's not, whatever. I don't really care. I think we're valid. If you want to go jack off and watch Star Trek Beyond, (laughs) you're just a fucking moron. You need to die, but, you know, whatever. It's the same people that... Like those Rob Zombie movies, people that or lots of yeah, you know, people that just, lots of people that just like whatever's thrown down their throat. You know, they don't have, they don't even think about it or really pay attention if it's good or not. They're just kind of like, yeah, man. Like, did you actually sit there and watch the Star Trek movie 
and think about what you were watching and like look around when the movie was playing and be like, this is cool right now. What's going on? Or are you just like blindly staring at the screen until it's over? Then you're like, yeah, man, it was good. I was I was playing Pokemon the whole time. Right. And you're like, you didn't like that movie. You were on your fucking phone the whole I time. I think a lot of people just do whatever, you know. That's what I'm saying. People just agree to disagree with things and don't have a fucking pair of nuts. And they're just like, no, I hated it. Everyone has to like everything that's on television at them, you know. Yeah, I like Walking Dead. I like The Blacklist. I like the... Spartacus, it's like, why? You don't even watch those shows, but you like them. I like Orange is the New Black, I like Luke Cage, I like Supergirl. It's like, look, it's cool if you really do like all those shows and you're really into all that stuff, but I doubt it. It's like, I, you know, people just like what they're told to like. And that's not what we're about, kids. We're not about what you're forced or told to like. This is death metal country, this is horror movie country here. We like what we like, and that's the point. It's like, you gotta like what you like, not what, you know, your friends on Twitter tell you to like, you know. Just be more mindful of what's going on or what you're paying attention to, because you might be like, hey, why the fuck do I even like this? And then you'd be too scared to admit it that you don't, actually. And here we go, back to the, back to the film, finally. We're about to get the mother-daughter reunion here from the grave. Oh, they do... Okay. That was a nice ode to the original. She, like, just straight up bites her jugular instead of grabbing the trowel and, like, fucking stabbing her to death. And the the blood spurts over top of the trowel. That's kind of... Funny Todd's whipping ass. Yeah, he is. So that that was cool. They didn't... She didn't pick up the weapon, but, like, blood spurted on it against the wall where it was hanging, and that was pretty cool, so. I thought they were going to get the actual stab back, but they they rewrote it and tried to, you know. They kind of shortened that scene. That scene was really long in the original. It was a big build-up to her walking towards her mom with the thing, and she's like, what are you doing? Are you okay? Are you okay? And then she just starts stabbing her, and you're like, holy fuck, it's pretty... Pretty visceral scene in the original film. Probably my my favorite part. Besides the N word. No, I pay for internet, and for some reason my internet never wants to work here. I don't know why. This place is a fucking prison. That's why. I'm serious. It doesn't make any goddamn sense. Okay, fucking awesome. Oh shit! Fuck. I'm so close to having this. What is it? Surprise. Huh? It's a surprise. Oh. For you and everybody listening. <laughs> How much time you got left on it? What? The thing. It won't fucking play, because I, I don't know what is the up with the internet. Even when you, when everything was working, it doesn't want to work. I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, Tony Todd is like Steven Seagal in this movie. It's like flipping zombies over his shoulder and cracking their necks, and that's pretty awesome. Pile driving them in back into that the grave. That's not what I wanted. That's what I want. So fucking close. <laughs> Well, they just hit a, a cop zombie, so they're trying to get his gun. Smart. What is wrong with this? There's some somebody somewhere around in here has some kind of a firewall or something. Because it, it's done this. All right, now it's time to move on. There we go. <laughs> what is that? I don't think it's going to play. I've been trying to get this thing to play for 20 minutes. So the Tony Todd is about to shoot. Oh, shit. Harry's not having it. He's like, that's my little girl. It's like, not anymore. Have you ever read the Bible? 
I, well, I read parts of it from my religion class. And it chokes right at that. Damn it. Jesus Christ is gnarly looking. From the Bible's description, I tell you what. <laughs> I tell you what. <laughs> anyway, that's that's what I deal with when I try to go to a show right, that, or a movie. Corey and I have to go in and it's, I tell you what. That, that segment has been birthed on our podcast as of today. We have to have a segment called I Tell You What. And it's... It is. I don't it's, know. We have to figure it out, but we'll do it. We'll do we it should. live. Or it's just like, all right, now it's time for I'll Tell You What. And then we just... We tell you what. Well, it's just dealing with these fucking... I don't know. Yeah, we could do that. It could be a uh, stupid encounter with somebody. It's called I Tell You What. It's pretty funny. But uh, I don't know if we've ever plugged our own social media bullshit, but um, if, if you guys listen to this and you have Twitter or Facebook... I can't get on mine, so mine's point. follow is. us at Phantasm Podcast. It's that simple. It's Facebook.com slash Phantasm Podcast. Oh, cool. F-A-N-T-S-A-M. You know, you yep. know how to spell it. And at Phantasm Podcast on Twitter. Or you can uh, go to YouTube... YouTube.com slash Phantasm Podcast. I've been trying to put some stuff on there. Yep. I got a Cat in the Brain interview, uh, uh, review on there, sorry. Uh, when I did the unboxing for the Blu ray, uh, Corey interviewed himself. On that. <laughs> Following up on that, I did not, was not impressed with the Blu ray print. I think it's a, uh, actually just, it looks like the DVD to me, so. Uh, hey, not, but it's not, only $40 on Amazon <laughs> right now. Not much. It's a great deal. Yeah. Not much, uh, Difference really from the DVD. I, I haven't tried to pop in the DVD that came with it or my old one. Comparison, you know, do a comparison with the Blu-ray, but it's not far off. I, I realize that that movie is not taken care of, and it's got a, a lot of scenes in there from movies that they definitely will never have on Blu-ray by themselves. They're just old fucking Fulci movies or movies Fulci produced. Um, so yeah, that's on our YouTube page. I think we got the the Brian interview on there. Um, it's a pain in the ass for me to just make a video of all these episodes. I'm trying to just do all the interview ones we've done and put them up there for you guys. So if you're a YouTuber, you know, you can just go ahead and go on our YouTube and listen to it on there if you don't have iTunes or you don't want to use SoundCloud because you hate it, whatever. Uh, try to have. Are we little... up or down on SoundCloud right now? We're up, we're good. Uh, oh, fuck yeah, cool. We just. Uh, cool. I try to make it easy for you guys so that you have. Everything and where at your disposal, so that way, you know, if one thing shits the bed, you have another source to listen to us. So you're never cast out. Um, also, if you have an iPhone, you can get the podcasts app, and we're on there too. So, oh, cool. any podcast app, whatever you have, we're on there. So just look us up, and uh, you know, give us social media some love, and retweet our shit, share our shit, uh, give us some feedback and stuff. Um, let us know what you think of the interviews so far. Uh, I thought they've been pretty stellar. Um, had a lot of fun. It's been an honor and a privilege to get the people we've gotten. And uh, it's been a real treat for me and the doctor to uh, get to pick the brains of these uh, mu- you know, musicians as well as uh, some, you know, Sean Clark from Horror's Hollow Ground. I mean, the, the, nice addition. the other horror stuff will come in time. It's just, you know, we're doing this by the seat of our pants. It's like, it's not, you know. Yeah, you know. It's not funded. We it's work privately just, funded. and We work just like everyone else, and we have schedules. We have to work around other people's schedules to get stuff finalized and done, just like anything else. So uh, we appreciate all the support you guys have given us so far, and and thank you for sticking around and, uh, you know, looking forward to what we have to bring you. And, you know, we're looking forward to bring you even more every sure. week. So, um you know, once again, thank you for believing in us and continuing to believe in us and just follow this fucking crazy train wherever it's going. So, yep. Um, crazy. That's how Corey goes. <laughs> Millions of people don't listen to us. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> oh, shit. And you can find me on social media at none of your fucking business. I don't exist. Dot com. <laughs> Or I Twitter flush me down the toilet dot com. Yeah, you cannot find us technically. You can find those things for the podcast, but we do not exist. Especially me. I'm a fucking ghost. 
that Corey finds and summons, and then I show up and then I disappear. Yep. That's all right. You're around as long as I need you. Exactly. Which is okay. Because that could be any amount of time. Cool, man. I hope so. <laughs> I hope it's for a long time. Hopefully you want me around. And Yeah. Well, you got nothing to do in your nether world, I don't think. No, I don't. Just, just no. exhuming bodies, man. That's all I do. Speaking of... I mean, this is pretty cool. I don't know. You're just eating bugs instead of flesh. It's interesting. It's kind of fun. But I, a lot of... Again, to go back to this, the, the print of this film, a lot of people had a problem with the blue hue on it. I don't. I think it's awesome. I like it. It adds something to the film. It well, if you see the, right, the standard of this, uh, the... I didn't like it. It's it's way too bright. Yeah. Like, this whole scene is lit. I don't know why people <clears throat> are... Because uh, it ain't what they remember. I don't know. It's I don't know. It looks fine. It, it adds... Some, Again, it was done by the cinematographer, it adds with something, Savini, your it adds, favorite person, and they did it. And It adds uh, something, you know, it, it makes it darker. But not in a sense of the color, but the vibe. Because blue and, and movies insinuates, you know... Dread or death, or you know, yeah. For those of you who need, you know, and this scene is not blue. There's really no blue in this scene at all. So it's it varies, but in the darker scenes, of course, it's very blue. But I don't know why that make or breaks this film for people. It's just like it does. I don't know why people have such a problem with it. It seems like I think I think uh, like one reviewer guy brought it up on a magazine or somewhere and then someone read it and then probably it, bloody disgusted yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then it then it blew up and everybody's like yeah that is dumb it's like you would have noticed it unless this hack said something about it so well they're you like know, yeah it is dumb it's like nobody I've never it. understood how some some of this stuff gets uh, it's like you watch James Wan movies all his movies are blue hue the hell so what the hell's wrong that's alright Toodle doesn't like the blue hue Lay down. Lay down. Big hairy butt. Lay down. Lay down. There you go. Now I get my foot and feet down. Uh, but yeah, the I don't know. Uh, I'll if you guys do this, I've skimmed through some other horror. Th- I'm just not impressed with a lot of horror sites. I think they're a fucking joke. And I'll tell you one that I wanted to specifically pick on that I think's went to shit is Fangoria. I don't even think that's a credible thing anymore. It just went to Do shit. Do they make magazines anymore? I don't know. It just now went to shit. Now I, I really just now it's rumor. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we got we got the we got the chick from uh from uh in this moment on the cover and we're gonna show you guys lots out. It's like that's not horror. That's stupid. I don't know the stuff that it seems it's, and I think that magazine's Canadian, isn't it? It's yeah, something weird. Something like it's that. something. But you know, whatever. I, and it's fine. People want to. The, the only thing that I'll ever say about that magazine, I'm not sure if that was that magazine or that this other one. I like that they showed all the Blu-rays that were out for that yeah. month. I thought that was cool. It was actually cool. a picture and a little review. I thought that was cool, but and some of those focus too much on like toys and all this other stuff and look guys I'm a huge fan of action figures but it's like there's also a point where it's like I don't need to see a fucking you know Hellraiser pop vinyl it's like I don't fucking care <laughs> especially if it's what like, haven't they made that's pop vinyl it's like I don't give a shit especially if it's something like Fangoria who's coveted by like cult horror fans and then it's like get her a cute little Funko Pop it's like that those takes away from the horror movie part of it like, look, I have pop vinyls, but do I have any horror movie ones to ruin that? No. Wow, well, that's a cuss word. Jesus, goddamn, holy love and shit is what he said. <laughs> like, do you see any horror pop vinyls sitting around? No. So. No, that had nothing to do with you. I'm just talking about you. They, I know, but those why are they all, would review something like that? Or I'm not it's, discrediting. Or it's, it shows. I'm not going to discredit of, horror movies. Like you know, I'm not going to display it in my home because I think they all look really dumb because take the horror movies pretty damn seriously so to have like a little cute little Jason Funka pop with little fake blood spurts you know, the only one that they cool. made of him that I thought was cool it's actually the only horror one that I've ever seen that I thought was cool they made a Jason without the mask that's pretty funny oh it is if you've never seen it actually see is. that you can pull off but with the mask I don't know cause they all just got those little beady eyes 
there was like a leather face one. It's like, look, he's cute. Like, that's stupid. It doesn't need to be done with horror movies. This is fucked up right here, I thought. <laughs> it's like, just fucking kill it. Uh, they're in the circle pit with the with the zombie. Look, it's Maryland Death Fest. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, man. Come on, man. Camel dick's about to come on. You're... Camel Sonic. That cut kind of off that carnage. <laughs> and folks, if you've been following along this whole time, we haven't even given you a uh, time update. But if you started, if you press play, as the soon doctor as will started, right now. We're on a, about eight minutes left of this fucker. <laughs> it's a minute and twenty sec, uh, an hour and twenty seconds, thirty. F- fuck. An hour and twenty minutes. Thirty. Hour and twenty seconds. minutes, thirty-eight seconds. Goddamn. Now they're right. <laughs> we got the zombies hanging upside down. They're at Maryland Death Fest. This is where the the tie vendor right here making the egg rolls. <laughs> uh, you know, that's a, something just to touch on that one more time, what I don't understand about <clears throat> going to any kind of a festival thing. I don't want to get loaded around a bunch of people I don't want to be around anyway. Yeah. When I get loaded, if anybody out there even gives a shit, when I get loaded, I'm <laughs> doing it to relax or to get away from something. Yeah. So I... I'm not gonna put myself in a place where I'm really want to gonna not deal with people, you know. Especially a lot of people. Oh yeah, man. No, thank you. I don't want to fucking deal with that. That's kind of funny. I mean, you can. People want to, you know. I whatever. That's fine. I get that. (sighs) And like I said, and we've even done it, even with VIP treatment. I still am like, eh. I just don't. I, can't so I said it. the other day, I don't know if I said it on the podcast or not, but I said, even even for a year's subscription to Amazon Prime, for free, I wouldn't do it. No. <laughs> it's just a funny saying. I don't know, now all the, the hicks have come out of the woodwork and they're killing all the zombies and Barbara's held out, she's survived. And all the, the hicks are looting the house. <clears throat> There's hardly anything left of this movie. Mullets and all, they're they're just trying to find something to shoot. Or a chainsaw. Really, it's a wooden door, they couldn't just kick it open. Well, remember, they had boarded that up. Oh, yeah. And there is Ben. He He's is zombified. a zombie. Yeah. He looks pretty scary. He looks like a fucking leather sofa. (laughs) (laughs) He looks like a fucking like leather couch or something. Jesus. Yep. Hated that. Mm -hmm. I don't know why she survives. It was like that's another thing, and I want to talk about this a second to stop listening. Not the fans, but the fucking Xbox. <laughs> Stop listening. Damn it. Something I never liked. <laughs> and this is something I don't like about George Romero as a filmmaker. I always felt like he tried to... I don't know. I felt like he's trying to be politically correct in some of his films. And I don't like that. He was, but at the time that he made some of his films, there. I'm not talking about not the Living Dead. I'm talking about like this, uh, Day of the Dead, the whole badass woman thing, and the whole. Uh, uh, yeah. it, it turns me off as a fan. Yeah, it's not done as a natural script progression. He's doing it to make some kind of a public statement. I don't like it. I don't like when anybody does that. And that's one thing. That's my only gripe about him as a filmmaker. Because I know you and Julia are big that. fans of his. I'm not a big fan, and that's one of the reasons, because it's in a lot of his movies, and yeah. I don't like that. I don't know why he does that, but he always picks, like, an ethnicity or something to make it, like... It's like, it's like okay, you're beating me with your politically correct hammer. I don't need it <laughs> in a horror film. I get that. Uh, someone that's also guilty of that, that that I also don't like, is John Carpenter does that as well. Yeah. And I find it offensive. Because I, I feel like they're going, everybody's dumb except me. Let me hit you with my politically correct hammer. 
you know, it's just I just think it's unnecessary. Yeah. You know, it's just it's and you, you know, even if you'd never told me uh, before we started watching this, because I didn't know that he had wrote the script for this, you can tell because it's one of those things where it's like when it's just so. A woman lives and she's strong. It's the same reason I won't watch those fucking uh, Resident Evil movies. It's like I, I don't need to see some badass girl flying through a thing in a leather thong. It's like I don't <laughs> fucking care. <laughs> I want to see a girl in leather thong. I'll watch her get fucked in a porno. <laughs> but but yeah, I, I like this movie. It has a good pace to it. I could do without... I thought him killing him when he had a chance to rewrite it was kind of stupid. Yeah. But it's different. <clears throat> but I think this movie flows way better. Yeah. it's. But it's also this movie had a bigger budget. It's later down the road. So he got a second chance to do it. Yeah, I mean it's it's got a lot of things working for it. I think. So and there's a lot of people that don't like this film because it's a Tom remake. Savini hates me. So <clears throat> was, I, I, that aside, not even you know. I know, but he was like, it was, I don't know, it's funny. I'm going to reshoot it again and kill Corey at the end of it. <laughs> I'm going to kill him with that Night Rider's Blu-ray. <laughs> Chop his head off with it. <laughs> Oh, uh, but you know, it's just gonna be me the whole movie drinking scotch, and it is what it is. I don't ruining people's Blu-ray. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I like this movie. I think it's good. It was um, good. I enjoyed it actually. I'm glad you did. Of course, guys. Now we have uh, in just a few seconds here. We'll have uh, Lee from Monstrosity, and uh, we hope you enjoy it. I'm thrilled to have had him come on finally we've <clears throat> been talking about doing this for uh, a bit now and we had him on and I'm really happy with it I hope he's happy with it and hopefully you guys will enjoy it and uh, as much as Corey and I did interviewing him it's a, he's a legend in the death metal genre as far as I'm concerned and a band that doesn't get any credit out of the other overrated crap in yeah. my opinion in death metal I think they're pioneers of it they're top shelf man it is it's it's quality shit, and he never. Shot, I don't shit. think he ever really cared anything about uh, uh, cashing in. The guy, it's true to his. He's art all form. about just true to his art playing, form, man. True to his art form. I think he, that's he loves jamming. He loves it screams it. In that he interview. loves he loves <laughs> writing stuff with other people and just getting stuff definitely, out. Definitely, uh, he's really into it. So you know, but before we get into that, uh, we first have to do our final thoughts. So first impression, I really like this movie. I uh, the remake of Night of the Living Dead, uh, nineteen ninety. It's very good. It's I don't know what it is. I just really enjoyed the pace of it. It's a lot more. Uh, the dialogue is a lot more modern, I guess, and there's a lot more dialogue. Period, because there wasn't a whole lot in the original film, and uh, it's not like it's it's actually way less gorier and bloodier. There's not much there with that, which is fine. You know, the original film didn't really need any of that, but there was a little bit of it. But in this film, there's really not. So, uh, you know, that's kind of cool. They used the, they saved the effects for like how the zombies actually looked, and uh, you know, the acting was was pretty pristine. So that that's where it shined in this film. Kind of proved, even in 1990, that you know. You don't need all this gore and stuff to make a zombie film. You can just have, you know, a good cast, a solid cast, and uh, some good makeup effects, and uh, you know, faster paced script. And there you go. You know, I think it was pretty, pretty, pretty decent film. I enjoyed it. I'm glad you liked it. It was. <clears throat> it just reminds me of being with my buddy Matt, <clears throat> um, who I mentioned in this podcast, a friend I lost. Uh, to cancer in 07 but we had skipped school and went and watched that film it's always fun to watch it's one of the ones I had to have yeah it was fun is it you know it's just I don't know it's a special film to me more I think it's more nostalgic but uh, I like it I don't but while I was watching it I wasn't bored but I wasn't like really intrigued but I was enjoying what I was seeing yeah if that makes sense so, yeah it's just a you're not, it's got a good pace you're not at the edge of your you're not at the edge of your seat but no, I'm also no, not, no. I'm also not the end of my bed like 
I sleep. But I'm not that way on a lot of stuff. I'm not that. There's not a zombie film that has me like that. So yeah, you know, it's 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 what you can expect from a zombie film. It's actually cleaner. It's not what you'd expect. You know, it's not like over the top gore. It's not crazy. You know, there's headshots and there's blood, but there's not right. It's not over the top by any means. But the, the acting's really good and it's fun and. Yeah, if you guys haven't seen it, uh, you didn't watch it with us, but you've been listening, go fucking check it out. Um, you can get that Euro copy or, you know, it's on DVD somewhere, however you watch your shit. Uh, we strictly do Blu-ray here. Watch the uh, one of 3,000 copies in Twilight Time, so thank you, Doctor, for prescribing that today. That's right, thank you. And uh, we like to thank you guys for sticking around, and... Even if you skip past all this just to get to the interview, either way, this needs to be heard. And uh, we now bring you Lee Harrison and Monstrosity here exclusively on the Phantasm Podcast. This is Corey Gorkreis saying, stay gory. We are here with Lee Harrison from Monstrosity. What's going on, man? How's it going, brother? Doing good. A long time coming, man. Happy to have you on here. I'm a huge fan, been a fan forever. I've actually got all my CDs here with me. It's quite really the cool. Cool. quite the stack. Yep. We actually have all of them out. It's like the guy's got a lot of shit. <laughs> well, it's a lot of work I put into that stuff, I can tell you that. Man, we yeah, man, you're a huge fan. I nasty behind the kit oh yeah man <laughs> it's i think you guys are unsung and that's why we wanted you on here you're one of my favorite bands uh just kind of jump right into this uh would you like to do a brief history of uh monstrosity sure um we formed in august of 90 kind of out of the ashes of malevolent creation um three out of four of us were in malevolent and it just kind of worked up where we ended up doing monstrosity and, and uh, I had found George in between and we brought him down we did a, our first show with Massacre in West Palm Beach a place called 21 More okay. that's killer man and it went horrible it was, oh, oh no, no. <laughs> yeah. what happened um, well we changed the set around at the last minute you know so we like put one of our harder songs kind of in the beginning and it just we, so we got off to a bad start. Right. I played horribly, I know that. And <laughs> well, you guys were up for the challenge earlier. Really. Like right and right. So basically our second show was kind of a redemption show. We played with Malevolent and Deicide at the same venue. Awesome. And uh, we just like had gone to the woodshed and really practiced and like just kind of went nuts with it. And then uh, so we came back to the second show and really killed it, you know. Right. And then so then the, the promoter from that show... He's like, hey, what are you guys doing tomorrow? You know, you want to go open for Pantera in Orlando? And so we're like, cool, yeah. <laughs> Damn, that's, that's crazy. That's a, now, was that was that Cowboys? Yeah, Cowboys from Hell Tour. And uh, it was our third gig. And it was kind of right after we formed, you know, pretty much. So um, we had done, done that. We had the whole Infinity demo done. That was just starting to get out and circulate. We were so happy with how it came. Like even the rough mix, we were already sending the rough mix out before we finished. Okay. Just we oh yeah. Yeah. And then when we went to finish it, we just couldn't get it to sound like that raw brutal that we liked, and and so we just went with the rough mix. And uh, man, I ended up losing the tapes when we moved. And then I left them in the closet, and we had just a million things. And, Oh, was, the place was kind of a disaster and just got kind of forgotten and left behind and never to be seen again. So, right. it was, I had it from a cassette, basically, we transferred it and did the little EQ in and boosted it more so when we did the Enslaving Masses release. Okay. So that's how I kind of got saved from that. But, you know, that was our original sound we like that like when when like the screen for horror infinity you know people just <laughs> raved about it and like everybody loved george so that scream only you know or just like that scream alone right that whole first like 20 seconds of the demo version of horror infinity was like you know that was 
kind of what we were out and what, you know, it was killer. Oh, yeah. And we had a real hard time recapturing it on Imperial Doom, you know. It was just like we had played it slower a little bit, and just the screen never came out right. We did it several times. I mean, it's okay, but it just compared for us personally, you know, because the demo was way better, just, you know, even though the production wasn't as full and maybe as big. Yeah, of course. Just the whole performance and the attitude and all that just came across better on the demo as it usually does yeah you guys are probably more, a little more <coughs> amped up to get that out and, you know. yeah a little looser maybe not it's quite so nervous but right we're pretty nervous though like you know just <laughs> being in the studio and like knowing that we were you know I had to come off like you know just knowing that we had to do it in one take there was no you know we just didn't have time really right. I mean, we're just trying to get as much done as we could and like the amount of time we had and we, at that point we were in such you know we just grinded it out we just didn't have a budget you know it was like a few strings out of it so <laughs> so with Imperial Doom can you talk a little bit about the recording process on that well okay so after we did one Kennedy we just basically sent that out throughout the underground like people at Roadrunner we were trying to get the them okay uh, different magazines different fan teams you know starting to send it over to Europe and stuff because we had already started tra- team trading and malevolent stuff so awesome we knew a lot of the key players and stuff so we're kind of we had kind of the buzz built up and Roadrunner ended up recommending us to Nuclear Blast and that's we ended up with them really quick like within six months we had our record deal performing and uh, so that was like, you know, we formed in August. By December, we were doing War Infinity. January and stuff, we were sending it out. And that was when we did the Pantera shows and the ESAD Malevolent shows. And then, uh, so from then, like June was when we started recording the album. So those next few months was when we were, like, we wrote Imperial Doom, Ceremonial Void. And, um, those were kind of the newer songs, you know, right before. Recording. I've still got my original yeah. CD in my hand. It's fun talking to you about this. <laughs> right on. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we did the bass and drums in three days. I uh, just turned 21. Wow. Oh, wow. Trying. I was kind of, you know, it was our first time in a real big studio like that. And, you know, you think you know it all. And,. You just get in there and it's a whole different world, you know, because it's, oh, yeah. um, it's real, you know, clean, sterile sounding, and it's just you're not used to hearing things like that with like perfectly tuned drums, and like, you know, you're used to being in a loud warehouse with just the real acoustics. And so that was kind of a different thing, you know, and, and we made it through it. James Murphy came in, I'm awful, I remember that. Oh, that's cool. He was there for Darkest Dream. I remember that. Oh, you know, so had uh, Jason Goble from Cynic uh, help you guys. Jason right was there, yeah, and he played. And that was kind of cool how we brought him last minute because, you know, we we didn't have a fifth player. And I don't really know why we wanted one so bad. I mean, we could have got away with John, but uh, right. for whatever reason, we just thought it was a good idea to bring Jason Goble in. And he wasn't doing anything with Cynic because they were doing the Tom and Sean were doing the death thing Tony Choi was doing Pestilence or Atheist whichever one and you had, you had Mark in the band from uh, and we had been chasing <laughs> you know we were it's crazy you know Mark Van Erp was in Cynic before that so mm-hmm. he, you know we were all hanging out and so we were all buddies we lived in this warehouse me and Mark Van Erp lived in this warehouse where Cynic practiced and oh, yeah. I was in a band I was in a band called KGB and we we was down in uh, like Tamiami uh, Airport down there was like some warehouses in Miami awesome and uh, we lived down there and we just so cheap you know because eight, eight people split in the warehouse and it was like 50 bucks a month you know and so we could live there you know for 50 bucks a month you know and practice all day keep an eye on the equipment so nobody would rob the equipment and you know it was kind of a better deal you know oh yeah yeah we were young then and we were mm-hmm. just hungry for it so so anyway, uh, so then after after Imperial Doom happened, we ended up moving to Tampa, and then we lost kind of lost John Rubin on that one. He just wasn't up for the move ultimately, and right. kind of the rest, the rest of us, you know, George was kind of fluid because he was from Maryland, and he would go back and forth, so he really didn't care where we were. <laughs> um, 
And me and Janice were into moving to Tampa at that point, and we, you know, already started moving. And it took us like six months to get really settled in and get a new place to jam, and you know, everybody sure. situated. Now you guys ended up uh, touring Europe for the Imperial, right? Right. Yeah, that was that was pretty rough deal. You know, another another thing where you're young and you just you know you think you know the business, but you have no clue. You know? <laughs> Like, I think that it's going to be, you know, I don't know how to say it. I don't know. You just think, you know, we're expecting to get paid and get, you know, you know. get things done. You know, it's like, it just turned into like a different thing. And back then it was like, well, you know, they, they were paying for everything, so that was cool. But yep. in the long run, we paid it, we paid for it, you know, out of a record sale. So, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah like a learning experience and you know we were young and dumb and just having <laughs> a good time at that point partying and you were torn with uh, uh, Pestilence uh, you? yeah we did it was Pestilence in a band called Torture which uh, awesome that's pretty cool it was pretty cool like a young German band and um they were cool guys and um Pestilence was cool we shared the bus with them and it was like a testimony the ancients tour Oh um, yeah, that's a great album. album. <clears throat> that's a hell of a bill too, <laughs> both you guys on it. Lee, I wanted to ask you <clears throat> on on Imperial while we're still with that. The songwriting on that was who was uh was that you? Was that Well, like uh, the first song we wrote was Definitive Inquisition and that was me and Van Earp. Basically, like that, that was in, like I had like in my time off from Malevolent, like I was in Malevolent in 89, and then like October 89, I left the band, did my last, did the last show with More Than Angel. It was right before Alters came out. With them. Nice. And, uh, I didn't know you played with them. That's really interesting. Yeah, we opened up for them. It was Malevolent and uh, More Than Angel. Oh, cool. And we brought them obituary down. We brought a bunch of bands down to Fort Lauderdale. And, uh, but then I left Malevolent and for a minute that I was going to try to work with Atheists because their drummer was going off to college, but then that didn't work out. So I was doing my solo project, which I kind of was doing anyway. I was, you know, just writing songs on the side just for fun, playing with a four-track recorder. Nice. And so some of those, like, I ended up writing, like, nine songs, and then I ended up, like, plucking, you know, kind of my best riffs from that for the uh, Imperial Doom songs. And there were some of them, like, Immense Malignancy, like that whole first half, that decka 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 decka, all that bit. Hell yeah, that's awesome. That was from the submission. It was called submission. It was from that demo or whatever. Final cremation. That na 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 so basically, me and, me and Van Earp would like he'd throw up a riff and I'd match him a riff, you know, kind of in the first, in the beginning, you know. Oh yeah. Uh, the first song, first song was Definitive, and then the second song was Bird and Evil, and those were two, those two were the first songs, and then uh, and then Malignancy was after that, and then uh, so it would have been Horror Infinity and. We kind of like were putting Horn Penny together right as we were about to do the demo. Right. Because we had Final Cremation, it was the first song written after the demo, I remember that. Okay. Because we had it written, we were going to try to record it, but it was so new that we just didn't bother. It's <laughs> good. Show. So we had Final Cremation by December of 90, but that was kind of like one of the, you know, that we didn't, we wrote five more after Horn Penny, so. Nice. We wrote four after that. Then, then it was Darkest, Vicious, Ceremonial, Imperial. Uh, and Ceremonial Void was kind of a compilation of all of us. You know, Jason Goble had, like, some of that middle stuff was Jason Goble that oh, okay. kind of off the real off time, like, blast beat thing. That was Jason Goble's riff. And some of that ticket, da 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 that's Jason Goble. Okay. And then like the da 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 da
Right. That's like right up his alley. And then just like Don, the the Don, that was kind of me and Jason Goble. Like Jason Goble had like straight kind of thing. I'm like a riff, and he would come up with that. Came up with that. And we kind of worked it out in the tandem. Oh yeah, I was just jam that shit. So ceremony was kind of a compilation. Girl Doom was kind of my song. Like I wrote that. Like I kind of. You know, me and Sean Rubin just kind of got in the band room one day, and I just told him, you know, I, I showed him the first riff, that, and then from there, I had uh, the da na 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 and uh, you know, so me and John threw and girl doom together. But that was that was a lot of me. Whereas ceremony award was kind of more Van Earth and more uh, Jason Goble. Right. But and I think John, like everybody, had some on ceremonial. So that was kind of all of us. Okay. Uh, the production on it. Uh, did you have a relationship with Jim Morris, or was that kind of thrown at you by the label, or did you pick that, or? Um, you know, we wanted Scott Burns, obviously, because he had been the guy that was like everybody was right, talking right. about. And I had met, you know, I was kind of the guy that introduced everybody to Scott Burns as far as like Cynic and Malevolent. We were all at this show in, in, uh, in Tampa. We were driven up to Tampa from Fort Lauderdale, Miami. And I like was backstage, we were like behind where there's like a picture of Morgan Angel playing at this little barn warehouse hangar. Thing oh, yeah. out in the middle of nowhere, and Scott Burns was back there, and I ended up running over like, yeah, I just met Scott Burns, come meet him, you know. So I brought Paul and Sean, and I brought uh, <laughs> uh, Phil from the level, and I brought them all, and I introduced them to Scott Burns, you know. Oh yeah, that's cool. And, uh, so then, you know, so that so Scott was the one we wanted to work with, you know, because he had just done the Sepultura, he had just done the Obituary, so that was the name we were familiar with, right. But, you know, Jim Morris, you know, we were kind of, we weren't like, we weren't so concerned about it. We just wanted an album, you know. Right. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, I don't know, Jim Morris was kind of more of a, uh, you know, I don't know how to put it, but he was more studied on the equipment, you know. He'd gone to school for it, I think, and like, you know, was was Scott Burns had kind of come in on the fly as, as a, you know, just learning on the equipment, you know, on the spot, really. Yeah. And, you know, Jim and Tom Morris, those guys are phenomenal. They're really, you know, those guys are smart guys. You oh, know, yeah. Right. Playing around. <laughs> so, and it was, you know, part of it was, you know, it took me, you know, especially on Imperial Doom, you know, to trust them, you know, to be able to just, you know, like go with what they say instead of like hearing it my way, you know. And I, it was a hard lesson, you know. I really, you know, I can't listen to Imperial Doom. And I just don't like the, you know, the mix is horrible and, you know, it's my fault. But, you know, I just wish, you know, we had a little more time with it and, you know, I wasn't so young and dumb. <laughs> right. Which, you know, we, we're listening to these, you know, listening, we're mixing for those speakers, you know what I mean? And, and we just weren't <laughs> familiar with those speakers. You know, I'm used to listening on whatever I listen to at home and it sounds that way. And so you get in, in the room and the EQs are all changing around. So, like, everything's. You know, everything's all different. Now, you you know, it sounds good. You know, we were, at the time, we were real blast beat hungry. You know, we loved hearing the snare and the blast. You know, oh, so yeah. like, crank that snare. Yeah, I mean, crank I'm that still snare. like that, but... <laughs> I just, yeah, we're both big love, fans of love that. Love some fucking blast, man. I don't know what it is. Just always... So that snare is just way yeah. too loud. The drum, you know, you can't, like, certain riffs, like the blast beat riffs, you can't even hear the guitar riffs <laughs> underneath. I mean, that's yeah. a shame, you know? Yeah. Just, there's those... The songs are great, you know. The songs themselves are phenomenal songs, but you know, it, it, at the time, you know, I was proud of it and I liked it and all. But you know, I remember, I know for sure. I remember walking like out of the studio and we drove like ten minutes down the road to this girl's apartment where we were all staying. And uh, I remember putting the cassette in and listening. I go like, I knew immediately. Oh, we made a mistake, you know. <laughs> Whatever. I think it's a classic. I love it, man. I remember when I bought it. I bought it at a Camelot. Yeah. 
which no, no, Corey, no, no. Corey won't remember. No, no. <laughs> but uh, but like, yeah, it's maybe when that show was it's uh, <laughs> good stuff. Uh, move on next to uh, if you want to talk about Millennium. Cool. All right, so like you know, it basically took us four years between Imperial and Millennium. Wow. And, uh, yeah. Maybe even five because depending on how you count it, you know. Um, but we had a, you know, we had, we did the European tour, then we kind of ended up in a pissing match it over the royalties and the publishing and all that. Basically, so after the European tour, we came back and there was like, we were like, you know, well, we'll just get on whatever, we'll find some other label. And, you know, so like, we had, uh, I've contacted Boardwood from Blabbermouth. He was, at the time, I think he was just getting ready to go with Century Media or he was, you know, he was kind of, he had, him and Monty Connor from Roadrunner were big pals, and we were talking to those guys when we were trying to get our record deals, you know. Right. And uh, he more or less, you know, at the time, and, you know, we ended up, well, we're going to do this demo, and uh, we'll send it to you as soon as we get it done. You can check out our new stuff. We want to get a new record deal. And cool, cool, cool. So we ended up doing Slaves and Masters demo. That was 94 already, so like, you know, a lot of it too was like the lineup changes, you know, the guitar player, because we, we moved to Tampa, and so John Rubin, he didn't want to move, so we needed a new guitar player. Mark English was recommended us, uh, recommended to us by James Murphy, so we ended up using him for the Imperial Doom tour, so we had him for that, and our personalities were kind of clashing, we weren't really clicking in the beginning, and, uh, so we didn't we were like we weren't sure if we were going to stick with him so long story longer we ended up doing like a couple shows with Mark English and then we were looking for a different player right and we ended up we had we had this local guy named Chuck for a minute and he was he was he was a good player but he was drinking too much and he was partying too much (laughs) but we still used we ended up doing one like small show with him and just he pretty much proved that he wasn't going to be able to handle it right and so and at the same time we had just gotten a set tape in the mail from Jason Morgan and it was like four songs from Imperial pretty much note for note you know right it was kind of impressive you know because you know I mean he, sure he could have dubbed it in, you know he might have punched in or whatever maybe it's all fixed up we didn't know but <laughs> it was just rare for somebody to be able to come in and you know have our songs down like that and it sounded yeah. pretty right you know and like we're used to having to show everybody every little thing at that point you know <laughs> one was kind of a different world back then but yeah um, so he, Jason Morgan came down and he came in and like you know he was playing we were playing death covers like individual whatever those songs like we were playing that just goofing around and, um, then you guys ended up with Kelly from death right and that you know that was kind of another thing is that we had problems you know Van Earp had problems with the legal system so he wasn't able to continue with the band and so kind of last minute we brought in Kelly Conlon and uh you know the songs were written everything was already done so he was kind of a last minute addition to it you know even though like the songs had been written with Van Earth sure. Manic and, um, Slaves and Masters even though that was a lot of my you know, that was mostly my song but right. like the like there's a lead riff or something he wrote but and what was the other one uh, so, uh, Storm Winds was the other song yeah which, that, that was more more Mostly mine too. But. <laughs> so that was kind of the end of the manner thing because you know he wrote you know Manic was a good you know that was mostly manner he he wrote some great riffs on that song. Oh yeah. And then, uh, Dream Messiah and Devious Instinct, Fatal Millennium. That was kind of me and Jason Morgan. That was kind of like the newer direction of, that we were going in, which was like kind of full board technical. Yeah. You know which. Just- Ripping, though. Really, we, we didn't really realize it too much. We, I, I mean, it was we kind of like started with that, you know, and then it, then we kind of got out of hand with it, you know, <laughs> and we pulled back the reins before recording. Actually, because it was it was due to be crazy, believe it or not. <clears throat> <laughs> um, manipulation strain, like, like there's a whole crazy middle section in that song, and like it was like way crazier. It was like even more. Oh wow just twists and turns because as it is now it's probably 
are some like little off time things and it just kind of goes all over the place you know, in a short amount of time so, right. but it was even more crazy before and uh, so that we kind of pulled back the reins a little bit and then tried to make it a little more song structured but you know we, we really didn't realize it until after finishing the album and, and actually going out and playing the album that it was so like you know disjointed it's, as far as like the odd time signatures and stuff it just flew over everybody's head you know and it just didn't translate well live at all believe it or not and right. it was kind of like you know we kind of thought it was a dud really you know I mean not a dud but um, you know we thought it was a great album but just I think the production was a little bit dry we had some issues with the mixing we ended up going down to Fort Lauderdale and, or Miami to uh, Criteria Studios and mixed it down there and as professional and as big and huge and world class as that studio was is whatever right um, <laughs> they, they didn't know how to mix death metal you know ultimately they didn't understand the, the whole trigger and the kick drum concept you know mm-hmm. and the heavy kicks and, so yeah. it kind of like it sounded a little flat a little dry to us you know yeah. and, and the tracks are there I remember the, you know the tracks definitely sounded great but like with the final the final product was a little dry but I remember you know when we were playing the shows afterwards just like those you know some of those songs just fly over people's head because of the hot time signature so with Dark Purity we kind of tried to straighten it out a little bit and you know, we still wanted to have that but we wanted to have a lot more four four parts now you got Scott yeah. Burns on Millennium. <clears throat> did you like work, did you like working with him? Say it again. Uh, Scott, that did you finally got to work with Scott uh, Millennium? Yeah. Did you enjoy that? We got to work with Scott, and that was you know that was right when the whole cannibal thing went down, and then uh, George was doing he'd do us you know in the morning, and or he'd do a song with them like on in the morning, and then do a song or two with us in the night you know oh he was recording he was recording Vial basically right yeah right wow. do you That's now can I ask you I wanted to ask you a little bit about that I've never I've seen you talk about it on the Cannibal DVD but did they approach him at one of your old shows or did they do that privately or did you know all this was going well, down or the thing is, you know Rob Bell was living with me at the time he was running the room from me That's awesome. (laughs) So, like, Jordan was hanging out. You know, we were all buddies. Well, Barrett was in the, like, that Cowboys from Hell show. Like, Barrett played that show with us. That's fucking awesome. Like, we wanted Barrett to join, but, um, you know, he was dedicated to Solstice at the time. Right. Yeah, yeah. And we understood, you know. So, like, he ended up, you know, doing, helping us out when he could, basically, and then doing the Solstice other than that and then uh, when he got the cannibal gig we were all up in Tampa and so I rented him a room for at least a year I don't I can't remember it might have been a few years um so we were all hanging out you know and, and we're old friends and so he knew what was up with George you know he knew George was killer right uh, and but at the time I think Barrett had just moved out and uh, George was back in Maryland, you know, because he he never really like, you know, he didn't want to get a job, and he didn't drive, so like he would stay with us, and then he would go back, and he would come back, you know, stay with us for a few weeks, and then go back. So he was kind of always up and down, right? Oh, and then, and at that particular time, he was up in Maryland, and he called me, he was like, yo, uh, Cannibal called me, and they want me to join, and I told him I did. All right, cool, you know, no problem. <laughs> You know, and so then I called him back and was like, well, we're, you know, at least finished the album since we, we put so much work into it. Right, you know? sure, yeah. Um, we were right there at the finish line, you know, what I mean? just go ahead and finish the album and, you know, then move on and we can figure out who we're going to get from there, you know. Right. kind of how we did it. And it wasn't too long. We, we tried one guy, a guy named Andy Shade, and, uh, we tried him out, and then immediately after that, we uh, Jason Avery called us, and uh, from Mergy, and uh, we tried him out, and he worked out, and so we were kind of back, you know, even before it was finished.
finished and we had Jason Avery do backups on Millennium. He does like really, huh? I didn't know that. He does like this word fragments is Jason Avery. That's awesome. Oh, okay. Um, and so like we, you know, he might have done a couple other things, but so we like we we're all hanging out. You know, we knew what was going on. George and George and Jason were hanging out. Everybody's cool, you know. What was the last show George did with you guys before he was like, okay, I can't, you know, I can't do both anymore? Um, well, he just finished what he had on the books, basically. Which gotcha. Which was a Canadian, Canadian show and, and like, maybe one other, on a New York show, maybe. Oh, okay. So there was like, I don't know the Canadian, I think we missed the, the New York show. I think that ended up, we were late. We didn't make it in time. Yeah. Because I was curious if that it, I'm sure him doing that that messed up the touring cycle for Millennium or did it or did he do all that or? Uh, you know, not, not necessarily. I mean, it took us, you know, took us a little time to get going. We did like uh, Miami show and that Orlando show were the first two shows with the new lineup, and then uh, from there I think you know we started maybe doing a couple of festivals in Michigan. Uh, Milwaukee, I think we did that. Yeah. And, uh, I saw you guys at Milwaukee. I remember that. The Broken Hope tour. I saw the Broken Hope tour at. Uh, I saw that as well. And we did a bunch of shows on that one. We did a bunch of good shows too. We did like CBGBs. We did Whiskey a Go Go. We did nice. uh, the Riviera in Chicago. Um, awesome. Some big shit. And, like, the Tampa show, they weren't even going to do a Tampa show, and I ended up throwing that together for, like, a Monday night. You know? Oh, wow. <laughs> big night. Pretty huge. It's pretty cool. Now, at this point, yeah. were you, you're, so you've got, you've got Jason on vocals. And uh, yeah, Jason, and then uh, Kelly on bass, Jason Morgan on guitar, and then uh, for Extremities, that tour, that was when we brought in Pat O'Brien. And uh, he was on second guitar. That's awesome. Okay, so the, now that would uh, the, I'm sorry. We had this girl, this friend of ours that I had been writing with, uh, you know, maybe tape trading with, and she like, she's like, yeah, I got this guitar player guy. I can't tell you who he is because he's in a big band right now, and, but you know. He's looking for a gig, and he wants to, you know, wants to get with somebody. And it was Pat O'Brien, you know, and he had just left Nevermore. It's awesome. And so we did that tour, and um, yeah, he was killer. And that's is this that's still Millennium, right? Yeah, that's '97. Okay. Spring '97. And at this point, are you riding in Dark Purity, or is that? Uh, not quite yet. Okay. No. Um, so we did the, that Extremities tour, and things were with Jason Morgan. You know, he was another one where he didn't he didn't want to work. He didn't uh, drive. So, like, you know, you kind of had to put him up if you wanted him around. More right. Or less, you know? And um, things were just coming ahead. He wanted to come back to Tennessee. He didn't really want to. He didn't like Florida. He always complained about Florida didn't like the people here and you know always complained about everything as far as that goes and so he went back to Tennessee and we were kind of left looking for a guitar player um we had this guy that Kelly knew from St. Augustine Florida um his name was Jamie Harris okay and he did uh we did a show in Detroit with him and we did a show in Mexico City. Nice. And he ended up, like, we didn't really know him that well. And in the meantime, he had, he had run into some problems with, like, the law where he got busted. He kind of had a little the drug issue of some sort. And uh, so he didn't really work out. And uh, it was funny, though. It was a funny period, I remember, because it was just, his parents owned this Christmas shop. And, <laughs> oh, God. And, and, and we used to have to call the Christmas shop to get a hold of him. <laughs> he was always working at the Christmas shop. 
<laughs> you know, it'll be summertime and we're calling a Christmas shop. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. That's fucking hilarious. But he was a good guy and he was real funny and, and we, had, we had a good time with him. And, and so that Mexico show was good. And, and But there was, you know, so it didn't work out with him, long story. And uh, that, that was around the time we got Jay Fernandez. Awesome. And he, you know, he was from Brutality, but he had kind of, you know, Brutality had been broken up by then. And right. Whatever had happened with them. And Jay was doing, he had done some other kind of rock, more rock band type stuff, like, sure. or, you know, maybe whatever's going on in the radio. I don't know what it was. It just seemed more, you know, wasn't full on death metal. Right. You know, like, so he was doing some other bands, but he was still, you know, he could still play and, and whatever. So, like, we were like, yeah, bring him in. So Jason called him and we gave him the tablature we had, you know, so he could learn the songs and he learned, you know, the, the Millennium songs and a few of the Imperial songs. We worked up a set and then that's when we started writing like Angels Men Home and uh, the Dark Purity stuff. Awesome. I had Dark Purity, like Dark Purity was already done. I think I already had that written by myself. Right. And then uh, one other song, um, "Dust to Dust," was already done, but it was kind of in the, it was in the, it was like in the back burner. That one we weren't even going to put that on the album. And "All Souls Consumed" was another one. And what those two songs in particular weren't even going to be on the album for like the very last minute, but they were written like way before, you know. Um, but it was a case I'd just kind of forgotten about them and put them on the back burner. And then I started writing with Jay. We wrote uh, Angels Venom. We wrote Suffering to the Conquered. Um, Jason Avery wrote Eye of Judgment. And like he had that first riff. And oh, okay. Some of the other stuff. Um, Perpetual War was like my riffs. Like the do it, 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 the do it. Like that's it's good shit it is that's a great album I love that record I know it's so that 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 song was mostly me there's some Jay Fernandez like the chorus is Jay Fernandez and like maybe some of that middle section it was kind of both of us who collaborated on it okay um and then like Shapeless Domination that was something that I had um I guess, uh, yeah. So that was basically a lot of me, Jay Fernandez, and uh, Jason Avery. That was kind of dark purity. It was mostly us three. And then at the last minute, Jay Fernandez, like, he stopped coming to practice, and he just, I don't know, like, hmm. he had girlfriend issues or something going on with that. I remember always trying to get him over to the house to practice and we just couldn't get him and eventually and at the same time Derek Roddy had referred me to Tony Norman and so I had Tony Norman at my doorstep you know and I'm like this guy's shredding it up and he's ready to go he's all about it you know versus a guy that's you know not all about it <laughs> right I like Tony Norman so, I thought he was an interesting player to have with you guys yeah, so then Tony kind of came in and he kind of cleaned up, like, um, well, I take that back. We actually brought in Jason Morgan back for the album just because I didn't, I was so, like, insecure about what was going on. I just, you know, I didn't, I mean, we, we probably could have been fine with Tony Norman, but I just felt, you know, at least I know what I'm getting with, you know, Jason Morgan. Right, he's so, right. He's so killer. And, you know, so we ended up, he ended up, I ended up sending him like a set tape or whatever and within like three days he had like the whole album down and he was down here and we were recording within like a week or so. Did you go back to and more sound for that album? Yeah, yeah. And that was with Jim. Jim again. And at that point I just, you know, I trusted Jim and I knew that if I just let Jim do what Jim does that I would have a killer sounding album and that's exactly what happened. Oh yeah, it's a that's a it's I think that's a really uh an overlooked masterpiece. I, it, in Dark Purity that's Corey's favorite album actually, is in Dark I love Purity. It, yeah. Uh it's such a shitstorm, I love it. It's good. <laughs> you talk a little bit about the cover art. That's some interesting cover art on that one, Lee. Right. Okay, 
well, I, you know, everybody seems to complain about the cover art. Um, we think I it's, I, we think it's cool. cool. I just was interested how it came about. I think it's neat. It's a demon oh, no, pulling a soul out of an angel. Um, it's cool as fuck. With Millennium, you know, we had, we had tried to use this guy, uh, S.V. Bell, and, like, we sent him money, and we were like, do this, do that, do this, do that, and it just didn't work out. You see great. Yeah. We were just out of time, out of time, and somehow we ran across that Millennium cover, and it was more or less just go ahead and use it. You know, we, right. It was more out of necessity at that point. So with Dark Purity, we'd actually, uh, Jason had come into the, Avery had come into the band, and he was real, like, conceptual and had, like, a lot of good ideas as far as trying to come up with these concepts and, like, sure. you know, things like that. And he, the guy that did the eulogy cover was uh, a guy named Eric Johnson. And so we ended up going to Eric Johnson's one night and like hanging out with him and gave him, gave him some ideas. And then like a few, like maybe a month later, we went back over there and he had that whole in dark purity cover done. And <laughs> it was That's crazy. Like a, other, other than a few changes, you know, so that yeah. was like the first thing, you know, it was like nice to have, you know, we had that cover like done like way in advance. So yeah, that was like to... real nice cause Cover art's kind of a bitch, you know. Yeah. You know? It's an interesting. Yeah, I, mean, co- I always thought it was. It's memorable. That it, it sticks out of my CD uh, collection. I think it's cool. It's almost like a death metal Iron Maiden cover, you know. Right. I it's think it's funny, fucking cool. Like one of the comments on some video or whatever. It's like, oh, it looks like a late '90s video game, you know. It's oh gee, you know, like Photoshop thing. <laughs> it was like it's probably what it is. You know, it's late '90s. Gee, I wonder what, it was. you know. It does but, look late know, 90s, me, but it to, looks good. We like oh. that, you know, and then with Enslaving, we liked how, we, you know, it was Eric Johnson again, the same guy, and, and you know, I'm, are you familiar with the cover on Enslaving? We got it right here. It reminds me of uh, yeah. Nuclear Assault. Uh, Survive, yeah. Yeah, Survive cover, almost. Well, what it is, it's the demo cover, you know, the whole Infinity. Right, it's it's what it looks like. And it's kind of like, it kind of ties the concepts together for, to me, you know, yeah. I mean, it has that affinity team, but it also like, if, like the other panel of it has like the church burning in the distance, which yeah. is the Dark Purity Church, yeah. the, the winged guy from Dark Purity is in sure. that, you know, so it kind of ties the it's colors a mix of together everything. to me. I like the, uh, the color of the logo, that's probably my favorite, like the green, like turquoise color is fucking, it's fucking bitch. All right. Cool. So the uh, yeah. and, and then uh, so for rise to power we ended up using a guy out of uh, Poland, um, and in spiritual apocalypse we were going to use Eric Johnson again, and he submitted some and we weren't crazy about it, and then we ended up finding uh, David Ho, which was just some guy Mark English found, and I contacted him, and we ended up using that piece for spiritual apocalypse. So. You know, and now here we are again, and, and as it looks right now, it looks like our singer Mike Robichek's going to do the cover. Awesome. Really? That's crazy. But uh, we've been, uh, we, we were contacted by the guy that does the ghost covers. Uh-huh. Huh. Um, and he did, he did some behemoth, and he did, uh, like, a Paradise Lost. He's a pretty cool guy. So that was cool. We got contacted by him. I wouldn't mind working with him. But it's kind of a different style for us, so I don't know if, you know, I'm not sure, you know, if it would work or not. Right, y'all look like a, don't want to look like a pop band. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you know, my my favorite art is uh, Left Hand Path from Entombed. Oh, that's fucking that's, awesome. Like yeah, favorite. the Seagrave. Like the, C, the Seagrave thing, but, like, I always liked Seagrave when he had, like, a solid idea, like the Malevolent Creation. Sure. Ten Commandments, that was, like, an idea that was oh. already... Or, you know, effigy or, uh, you know. He just recreates it, you know what I mean? Because yeah. like, our, our cover was cool, but just the concept was a little weak for me, you know. But right. I just thought, you know, like that dis- dismember, like an ever-flowing stream, that's a killer. Yeah. And two of left hand path, that's a killer. So, like, those are, like, to me, the pinnacle. And, like, everything, you know, I'm kind of picky with art. Like, everything else kind of sucks to me. <laughs> actually, <laughs> that's funny. Actually, when I met him, I got a left-hand path print from him that he signed for me. So that's, that's my favorite cover he ever did. I'm with you with that. So the, you talk about the, if it's okay, we'll, we'll keep going here. The uh, You want to talk about the tour cycle for In Dark Purity? Okay, yeah, for that we did, uh, we did, like, 
Milwaukee Metal Fest, and that was horrible. Man. Oh shit! Huge, uh, big, big room, chock full of people, just a million people, and like the, the drum trigger like totally messing up. Dude. So it was oh, like shit. just kind of like it was horrible sounds. Oh, I'm sorry. But, but, it, but it was a good show. Everybody loved it. You know what I mean? But just for us, it was like... Right. Yeah. So if you can hear on your end, uh, you know, the fans are just yeah. going to raise hell and you're, but, you know... So we did that, and then uh, we did the Dimmer Borgers first tour of the U.S. Really? Huh. Dimmer Borger. It's interesting. That is interesting. I didn't know that. Like, when they first came over to America, they didn't, they didn't really like America. I remember them bitching about it. You know, and then I think later on they eventually came around and we're like, oh, you know, I think they enjoyed it later on. But right. then we got to meet Nick Barker and became good friends with him. And, sure. Um, yeah, everybody was cool. Um, you yeah, know, the big guys, ML. <laughs> all good, man. Had a good time. Did like 30 shows, just, you know, all across the U.S. Wow. And uh, then after that, we did. Uh, I think we did a headline run with this UK band called Desecration. Okay. That was pretty, that was pretty small, and, and at the time, like, uh, I remember we were going through some lineup issues, and Avery wasn't as solid then. I remember that. Okay. And it wasn't long, it wasn't long after that, we ended up bringing in this Tony Norman singer from South Carolina, this guy Bobby, and he did a great corpse grinder I wouldn't say impression, but he just had that kind of... Right. He could do that vocal style real good. The screams and the whole bit. Right. And he fin- did he finish the tour and Jason was dismissed? Yeah, he, we like ended up... Uh, we ended up doing like 30 shows with him. But like we, were, we had like two weeks off and then we did a Morbid Angel show in Miami. And then we had two weeks off after that, and then we started another tour with Deeds of Flash. Awesome. And so, like, so we came back from those, the first 30 shows, and the singer went back to South Carolina, and it was like time to do that more of an Angel show. And it was like, hey, dude, you know, we're trying to get in touch with him, and we can't get in touch with him. And it was getting down to the wire. So I called George last, you know, kind of last minute. I was like, hey, dude, we got this show for the Morbid Angel, and we're going to be for us. You know, sure, no problem. So we did that reunion show with George, that was a killer. We, you know, ended That's up awesome. blowing, you know, blowing the doors off the place just because, <laughs> you know, everybody was so hyped up about it. And right. then, uh, That's awesome. But then we, we had the two weeks off after that, and then we tried to, we had this guy Chase, this friend of ours from Fort Myers, we were going to try out. We had just played with him. So we, we checked him out, and, uh, He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he came out, he came, drove up from Fort Myers to Tampa and he rehearsed with us. We played, you know, played a few of the songs from Dark Purity. I remember that. And then uh, he was going to come back up like another time or whatever. All right, cool. And he's like, calls me one day. He's like, you know, I can't do the tour. My girlfriend this, my girlfriend that. I can't do it. Can't do it. And we, you know, we got like, you know, we're giving them like four or five days before this tour is supposed to start. <laughs> right. So he's like, well, check it out, man. I can't make the tour, but my guitar player here, he wants to audition. He can sing. He does backups for the band, and he can sing when he wants to try out. You know, is that cool? Right. Can we do that? Like, yeah, all right, yeah, we'll check him out. So <laughs> that ended up being Sam Molina. And so Sam ended up coming in, and like he was like on the van ride to San Francisco where the first show was he's like just writing the lyrics over and over like he's you know in trouble from you know at school or somewhere he's just got to write lyrics over and over just trying to remember him and trying to get him in his head listening to the CD trying to learn all the songs and stuff right so like he had three days basically to like learn like ten songs you know <laughs> And he did a good job, he did it, and then, uh, first show was killer, second show was a little weak, um, just because it was in Corona, California, where we had played, we had some really, really good shows there before, and the people, like, were, you know, they were kind of paying attention, and knew what was up, you know, and right. so they, you know, it was, they could, you know, they could tell it wasn't like the normal monstrosity for them, you know, so right. the show was a little weaker, and uh, 
then the third show was in Phoenix, and that was the first time we played there, and we didn't really know anybody there, and so that, but we had a great show there, and, you know, it was like... Awesome. Yeah, um, it was kind of a surprise of the tour, to be honest, you know, it was, you know, Sam did great on that show, I remember, it was probably the best he ever did. Wow. But anyway, we kept going, we did some more shows, like, we finished that tour, and then we ended up, not long after that, we got contacted to do a Mexican tour, and we did, like, three weeks in Mexico Damn. and how that worked was we ended up flying out to Mexico City and we had already been down there with uh, we played with Overkill in 93 that's fucking in sick that was, that was at the Southside Bowling and I was huge but this time we were coming in and uh, what we were doing we would stay in Mexico City during the week and then on the weekends we would drive to like these you know different cities in Mexico you know like different areas you know so that's interesting we come back to Mexico City and then we go back out and go back you know keep going back and forth right. we did that for like three weeks and you know cause not you know pretty much no bands were really touring Mexico they would come in and play Mexico City or maybe they play Juarez or maybe they play Tijuana but nobody's like really getting out there and touring so that was kind of cool you know because right. We just got into some space, you know, some places where shows just didn't normally happen and playing some bigger events. Like we were playing an arena and down, you know, some little toy owned Mexico, you know. <laughs> Weird. Heard, That's cool. You know. Wow. So that was cool, you know, that was a good time. And then uh, not long after that, um, we were, me and Sam and Tony pretty much wrote Rise to Power. Okay, yeah, that's what where I was headed. You've already got yeah. Love the cover art on Rise to Power. I think it's awesome. With that album, we uh, like a, we did the demo with Sam, and uh, like Sam wrote a lot of the lyrics, and but kind of at the last minute, we just we just felt that uh, you know Avery was ready to he wanted to come back. He was part of us to come back, and we we kind of wanted to keep some continuity if we could you know right and so we're you know and ultimately Sam was more of a guitar player than a singer right. you know because that's where he had come from the band he was in when he was a guitar player so we're like check it out dude we want to bring Avery back but we don't want to throw you to the curve either we want to you know how do you feel about playing guitar and he was you know open to it and he was cool and it all worked out so awesome you know he ended up learning the rest, and right then we were getting these killer offers. We did Puerto Rico, we did uh, Venezuela, and we did this huge Rock Out Park Festival, and that was like eighty thousand people, and we headlined, and it was it was it was through a connection we had at this radio station in Bogota, and right. he ended up hooking us he ended up hooking us up, and last minute Tony had just gotten a call from Morton Angel to tour with them and so he was all focused on that you know and right kind of kind of was a bummer man because he blew us off for, for to go jam with Trey in some warehouse instead of playing in front of 80,000 people when he could have just easily done it but whatever it was all good Damn. and so we ended up doing that as like a four piece with Sam alone on guitar you know without Tony right and then right after that we kind of that was when uh we brought Mark English back, and Mark had been out of the circuit. He'd been, you know, he'd gotten out of playing guitar for a while. He'd got a regular job and kind of was living the normal life thing for a number of years. But then he had come back around, and he was starting. We were jamming on some other projects together, and had just been jamming. And uh, when I needed him, I was like, "Hey, you want to do? This? We got this tour coming up. We had." To, um, we used this booking agent that Avery was connected with, and uh, it turned into a total fiasco. Oh shit! What happened with doing, that? Doing, like doing like it was the guy's fault, you know. Like he just did. He totally like just put the shows on sale and like totally expected, you know, to use the money from these shows to like just finance the whole tour instead of being, you know, actually, you know, connected and having it going on. And, and so we ended up getting over there and like. We got four shows, and like the bus driver's not getting paid, we're not getting paid. Fuck. And, and then the Metal Blade, you're the guy, Michael Traeger, who was our guy from way back, you know, like he was our, one of our main 
contacts from the early days of Nuclear Blast. He had gone on and he was doing Metal Blade Europe, and that's how we ended up on Metal Blade as far as Rise to Power wow. for Europe. And But at the same time, there was some sort of like German translation issue going on, and just the way, the way they did the press release, it just made it sound like it was our fault and like, you know, like that we can't draw any people and that they're, they're poor, you know, it's just, you know. That would have made me mad. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it more or less just, you know, they threw it all back on us, you know, when it was just, it was the booking agent's fault, you know, the, the board didn't happen, it wasn't a success, you know, he didn't do posters, he didn't do it, you know, half the stuff that he was supposed to do. So, so there was anyway, no, there was but, no PR for Roz to Power in Europe then? So, that kind of, so we did those four shows, and after that, it kind of exploded. Avery, at that point, was like his attitude was really pretty much negative towards the whole thing, and he was over it. He had started doing the tattoo business and was making good money doing that, and it just it more or less took his interest away from what we were doing. Right. Um, so, kind of after that, we were... I kind of, you know, I just, I just was like, whatever, I'm just going to do my own thing. I, I wrote... Songs for my Lavoie project, which is my solo thing. Nice. I just kind of, kind of took the rest of 2004 off, you know, and just wrote these rock songs that I was working on, and Pretty just cool. focused on that for a while. And uh, I wasn't too long after that, this guy uh, Dave from Canada. He was just a fan, and more or less, you know, kind of gave me a pep talk, you know, not not to just let it go you know yeah and, and right at the same time this guy Brian Warner who sings for Vital Remains now he was actually our first was, interview with he was our first guest <laughs> on here Lee <laughs> yeah. really right yeah. on. well Brian um, did the European he was kind of hanging around and he's like yeah man let me you know he was hanging out when we were practicing or something he's like let me sing angles on him with you real quick you know I was like alright yeah no problem so we played that and um like that's like the next day right around that same time period I got I got this offer from uh, our booking agent out of Poland for like 33 shows in 33 days with Deeds of Flesh and blah 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 Awesome. So, like, I was like, well, you know, we got this singer guy, and we got this tour, and we'll go ahead and put it together, you know, so I more or less put it, put it back together and did that tour, and that, you know, we had a good band, but Brian, you know, he was just new to, new to the band, and um, we just, I don't know, we felt his vocals weren't strong enough for what we were doing, and... Um, Mike Robichek was in the opening band Vile. Oh, yeah. And we were watching him every night. We were watching him every night kill it, you know, and he just super power. Just, and uh, so we ended up talking with him. And we, we weren't sure that we were going to use him either, but he was like an option, you know. We, right. we knew we wanted to get a different singer, so um, we ended up bringing in um, Mike Robichek for spiritual and right. right after that we all went you know we like had a super huge deadline to get it done so we could go to Mexico with Mardu awesome um, three, three shows with Mardu in a uh, thing called Cetherial okay maybe uh, oh uh, cattle decapitation or okay so got that down and then right after that we did some more touring we just went somewhere else I forget where but um maybe Columbia or something nice and then we did the Vital Remains tour and that was the US we did a bunch of shows that was pretty cool and then we did some US tours after that and then since then we've been kind of um doing one-offs mostly fly out dates you know festivals sure. so, you know, it's, it's a little different now with the dynamic in the band you know because Mike lives in New York um, Matt Barnes the second guitar player he's from Alabama wow um, our bass player was in Daytona it's all over so, the really, 
so really it's me and Mark English, you know, right here jamming, you know, and then kind of me and him are the main engine of it. Sure. And then everybody else kind of falls into place, you know. And it's okay. a little rough, to be honest, you know. It's uh, kind of a rough situation just because it's, you know, part of, the, part of the issue is that uh, it takes so much to get us together for, to do these shows and, and whatever. that We can only do shows where it's really going to be, you know, financially feasible. Sure. Which is a good thing and a bad thing, you know, because, uh, you know, it's like, it just makes it where we're not doing stuff that we shouldn't be doing, you know, like shows that, instead of, uh, you know, just playing every little photo venue from here to Idaho, you know, we're playing more select shows, being more selective about it. Right. Trying to get some money up a little bit, you know, get us paid, because we've always been underpaid, and, um... You know, we've always kind of struggled to keep up, and it's because, you know, the other bands, Cannibal Corpse, Morbid Angel, Obituary, they had strong labels through right. all those years, you know, and, yeah. you know, constantly putting out records every 18 months, you know, or whatever, you know, keeping a normal record cycle, whereas we've always kind of done things on our, on our own and yeah. kind of struggling to keep up on a business level due to the record labels, you know. Right. Spiritual but apocalypses. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lee. I'm sorry. But, but in the end, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, I own all my masters except for Imperial Boom, you know? And, uh, right. Even, the, you know, as far as, uh, you know, other bands, most bands can't say that. You know? I agree with that. I, th- I wanted to tell you, Spiritual Apocalypse is my favorite monstrosity record. Mine too. This is all now the new one is, but uh, you know, it's, I can't. It's always, it's always a new album. That's the correct answer for me. You know, what's the best <laughs> monstrosity? The new album. You know. Yeah. Um, was... A lot of people overlook that record just because it's not in pure You know. Well. <laughs> Too many people are trapped in the past, I think, because I, I mean, right. your catalog is. I think it's a good record too, you know. It's, one it's of my favorites for sure. I love it so much. I've got the version I bought from you from Conquest, and then I bought the Metal Blade one just to have it. Yeah, really cool, man. Yeah, man. I uh, can we talk about a little bit just the recording process on that? Because I, I really like this record. I think it's fucking fantastic. Did you see the DVD yet? I've got the DVD. I bought it from you. <laughs> yeah. And have you seen the studio? I have. Yes, I have. But I wanted to just kind of recap with you a little bit about it. I, I think the just your songwriting on this, I think it's great. Cool. Um, with that one, uh, Divisions of Darkness was the first tune written. And that was some, you know, I, I usually like write a song like right off the bat, you know, right sure. after we kind right. of finish the album, the previous album, and then take our time from there, you know. So like, uh, so Divisions was kind of the first song written, and then from there, uh, let's see, what did you do? Mark English had uh, Remnants, he had Apostles, and he had uh, one more. Um... Sacred Oblivion those three were kind of his songs and whereas uh, Bloodline Horror that was in, that was the one that was written first I'm sorry it wasn't Divisions it was Bloodline Horror that one's great was too. the first one we wrote and then but but it was kind of different it was uh, it didn't there was like other like Mark English kind of we ended up collaborating more on it you know we right. kind of tore it apart and deconstructed it a little bit and then uh, built it back up and turned it into what it is. But then, like spiritual, that's my song. Firestorm is my song. Divisions. Uh, in hum- uh, in human race, that one's mine. Triumph in black, that's totally mine. Um, that one had a little more of me main like doing the main songwriting. Yeah. It's a dark record, even for Monstrosity. It's it's dark shit. And uh, and then the new one um, is kind of like you know with Matt Barnes and Mark English. You know they they just you know the killer players, man. They, they, oh yeah, like you know they're the, the, smoking with monsters. You know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah. like, let them do what they do. So like so they kind of wrote a little more like 
Matt Barnes has like three or four songs. Mark English has three or four songs, and then I have three or four songs. Nice. So it's like kind of all like kind of like a more of an even thing writing wise this time, just because you know I let them do their thing. Whereas in the past, I kind of had to like make up for like you know. Right. Well, it turned out fantastic. People, like, you know, just kind of make it to make it all happen and to keep it going. I kind of ended up writing more out of necessity in the past. Whereas this album, I didn't have to do that as much. You know? Now the new record, you uh, do you have any kind of an ETA on that thing? Or yeah, it's kind of weird right now. We're like um, at this point, it's been so long. I've just kind of thrown up my hands with it. To be honest. Um, we, uh, it's, it's gonna look like it's gonna be 10 years, but I mean, cause it was 2007 when we did Spiritual Apocalypse. Right. And we started this album actually recording it. We started it in June of last year. Okay. So it's already been a year and a month, you know. Um, but no fault of mine, right. but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to hear it well, when it comes out. With, done, you know what I mean? We're like ninety eight point nine 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 percent done. We're just making like a few little minor tweaks on it, and then uh, the album cover stuff, trying to get that wrapped up. So, did you produce the record? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, awesome. Yeah. You know, and uh, it was done over at Audio Hammer. Oh wow! Cool. Which is uh, my buddy Jason Zukov. Yeah. And uh, Mark Lewis mixed this. Okay, it's pretty cool. I love, you know, it's nice. It's, you know, more sound got bought by the Transiberian Orchestra guys. So, oh uh, right, not an option I didn't know anymore that. for us. And uh, so, basically, um, you know, I mean, I love Jason Zukov. I would go there every time, but he lives in Sanford. You know what I mean? So right. it's kind of nice having more sound here, and and you know, more sounds awesome phenomenal you know so sure it was nice having it. but you know Jason Sukoff is no slouch either and stuff he's putting out is killer and I'm happy with it I think I think people will do it um and it's just you know it's just nice because it's kind of more low key and, and it's a different way approach to recording for me you know like right with more sound it's like you know usually a 12 hour block day Mm. And, you know, you, you just book by the day and, <laughs> you know, how many days you need, that's how long you take. Whereas with, with Jason, we kind of worked a different, you know, where it was like, uh, set him out for a week, you know, let's say. So right. Just, you know, it's a little more relaxed. You know, like that. All and we're not, we're not in a rush and, uh, we just, you know, we just way more time, like, changing heads and, like, really dialing in the tones and it's sure. all natural, like, the toms are real natural sound, and, but huge, you know what I mean? It's yeah. A, a yeah. huge sound, but real natural, not triggered, you know? I like, I like triggers on the kicks, but, you know, I like a natural snare, I like a natural oh, yeah. tom, you know? Right. And, Way to do it. We got it, you know, with the big sound where it's not, you know, because the part of the problem with that is that it sounds weak compared to the triggered sounds, you know, like some of these triggered sounds just sound so powerful because of huge, you know, triggers, you know? Yeah. Right. So it's, so it's, a, it's a, you know, it's a fine balance to keep that, you know, in check, you know, where you don't go too far, in the, you know, because yeah, I want it to sound powerful, but at the same time, I don't want it to sound all triggered out or like cardboard boxes or something, you know, <laughs> I, mean, I want it to sound like real calm. Sure. So, you know, it's nice being able to go over to Jason's and do that and have the time, you know, be able to spend the time and really dial in the Tom sounds and really, you know, get a natural sound. So you, di- you did the production with Jason then? Yeah, yeah. As producer, like, basically, you know, I make the final call as far as... Fuck yeah, know. man. Uh, it was a little different, to be honest, because, you know, um, and, like, with Spiritual, for example, like, we were in the studio, and we are listening on those speakers, you know what I mean? But at the same time, I'm, you know, like, well, for in Dark Fury, that, for that matter, like, that was like, we mixed that album on a little boombox, you know, I brought it in from... <laughs> Damn. Uh, from home, and we plugged it in, you know, we were just... Because I'm so sick of, you know, not, I, you know, hearing what I'm hearing at the studio is not what I'm hearing at home and what I'm hearing everywhere yeah. else, right. you know? Right, right. 
And uh, so I keep, we brought in my little, he's like, well, bring in the boom box. So we did, you know, and so like, <laughs> just being able to, you know, to dial it in. So with this album, though, it's been a little different because we're doing it over the internet, you know. Right. Like, yeah, so you can hear exactly what you're going to hear, you know. We did the drum track, yeah, so I'm like home listening to my stereo, it's very comfortable. And, you know, I just basically come up with a list of changes, you know, for each song. Nice. You know, and then he, he goes back and does them and sends it back to us. And then we make a new list of changes and send it back. And hopefully the list whittles down, whittles down, whittles down. And now we're down to like, we got like just two little changes we're going to do and we're pretty much done. Right. You know, and he's already, you know, he's mastered. He's kind of like got it already through his mastering chain, so we're hearing it kind of how it's going to sound. You know, so it's, I'm pretty happy with it. You Good know, man, to me, it's, it's awesome. It's, it's got your seal of approval. Out. I'm sure it kicks ass. <laughs> it's going to hang right there with the rest of them. You know, to me. So. Oh yeah. Now, band wise, is it the same lineup from Spiritual? Same is... lineup from Spiritual with Matt Barnes. Fuck yeah. So it's, uh, it's pretty basically different. the. the DVD I play a I wanted to tell you this real quick I play a drinking game with the DVD I'll watch that because it's pretty quick so I'll sit there and just get shit hammered and it's like you're doing your whole set <laughs> <laughs> it's fun man it's it's cool and I apologize you know the, the making of I've watched but I was so shit hammered I just thought I'd touch on that <laughs> instead of trying to remember what I watched right. on there but I, that, now the show I've watched I think that DVD's fun man I've turned several people oh, on to oh, it man like- we actually did two shows that weekend, and, and party song was the night before, and, and oh yeah, had phenomenal life, the phenomenal stage, uh, the huge crowd. I mean, people as far as you can see. Fuck yeah! And they videoed that with you know like sixteen cameras and this and that. And oh, it's that. beautiful. It was just too expensive, man. We just couldn't. <laughs> we just didn't want to pay all that money. Oh, I'm it. sure. <laughs> And the, and the brutal assault was a nightmare. Actually, it was like really? waking up, like waking up that morning at like five or six in the morning, and like having to drive straight to the venue and go Ugh. straight on stage. So, Christ, yeah, that's yeah, that's a train wreck. So you know, and like the, just the equipment was all messed up, and like Mark was having issues. Like his like the sun was so bright that he couldn't see his tuner. Oh literally. shit! So like he's up there struggling <laughs> about you know. <laughs> nightmare so it was kind of more of a nightmare show actually but uh it's, it just seemed to be like it was a little you know more cost uh whatever and you know made more sense financially to do it that way right, right. it's fun I, I love that like i said i've watched it several times i you know it's you, if you go on YouTube and you try to find, you know, show, he and I, Corey and I, watch, you know, death metal shows we find on YouTube and All stuff. But you know, time. some of them are just painful, though. You know, so I, I'm glad I have a monstrosity DVD that I don't have to go look the shit up, and you know, I can just throw it in and it's like a fuzzy to VHS it. rip. It's an actual, right. you know, DVD. It's nice. <laughs> or some drunk assholes like running around with the camera, grabbing <laughs> some chick, or some, I don't know what he's doing. You know, you can't see the damn stage. But beer on his crotch, you know. now there's a couple. Now I have to say that there's some you, you find some stuff on YouTube. I've never searched Monstrosity recently, though. I haven't. If there's anything you've seen on there that? Yeah, um, not really too much. It's there's like one song from Party Sign that's pretty cool that they put out. Um, Firestorm's pretty good. Um, I put up a few videos from the cruise we did. Nice. But no, I I love the DVD. I thought it was fun, man. I, I thought it was cool to have something like that. I was, you know, anytime you find it. was really cool, man, because like just the other day, we, I, I ran and met this guy or whatever, some local guy from Clearwater, and he's totally not into metal at all. And he's like a totally normal guy, but he's like, He's mean, like somebody had told him about me, you know, and he's like, she wants to meet me, you know, I can play, and this and that, you know. Right. So I, you know, I ended up buying a DVD off me. Oh, that's cool. And, oh. <laughs> and, he, and he took it back, and so, like, when he came back and gave me the review on it, you know, he's like, man, that was, wow. He's like, wow. You know, he's just still blown away by it, but of course, you know, guess what he doesn't like about it, you know? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I hate the vocals. What's with the vocals? Uh, yeah. People are fucking, yeah. Yeah, total, you know, just, you know, whatever. But, 
Yeah, that's totally to be expected. So. Oh, sure. People always tell me. Like, it, was just, it was just very cool, and it, it made me realize how cool of a, like, a, a introduction piece that the really is. Cause, like, it you know, is. You get yeah. to see the studio footage, you get to see the, you know, the touring aspect, and so you get kind of like a well-rounded, like, you know, you get to see Oh, hell yeah. And you're in front of that crowd, those people are fucking into it, and yeah. he's right. killing it on vocals, and you guys are killing it on the, you know, everything else. It's it's great. And seeing us travel through Chile and... <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Uh, that's awesome. I have to let Corey watch it. We'll get drunk and watch it. It's fun. Yeah, it's definitely a drunk and good time. Yeah. Uh... Lee, anything that you want to uh, say out there that you want to, you know, like tell people about your fans? Um, you know, I just I'm busy guy here, and uh, let's see. So we're about finished with the monstrosity, and we just finished the drum tracks for the terrorizer. Awesome, nice. And uh, I wrote all the riffs, guitar riffs on that one, and uh, so I'm sure the monstrosity fans will dig it. Oh, yeah. And then, uh, so we got that coming. Um, I got another boys in project, I'm doing that. Um, the Midnight release, from Descending into Madness, that, you know, it was kind of a different little trip thing that we took after a Spiritual Apocalypse. I ended up meeting Midnight from Crimson Glory and okay. kind of more of a different style of music. It was a different approach, but it was more, you know, my songwriting skills and my guitar playing stuff concentrating awesome. on one that rather than the drumming and it was you know very uh, rewarding for my creative aspect you know what I do just being able to work because you know Midnight was someone who I'd listened to when I was like 15 years old in my bedroom you know, right wanting to be in a band and wanting to do this and he had, you know he was a generation ahead and they were already doing it and it was just kind of cool like you know the all those years later to be able to like work with them and like you know just experiment yeah, and have fun and write songs with them oh hell yeah it's a culmination for sure and then uh, you know same thing with you know Matt Laporte who I worked with with the Midnight Project um, he was working with John Oliva from Sabotage on the John Oliva's Pain Project you know he passed away but right. he did work on Spiritual he did you know we were working together on uh, the Midnight stuff and he right. ended up Hooking up with the Tardy Brothers over in Europe, and he ended up bringing me into the Tardy Brothers project thing that he was working with, and that's how I ended up hooking up with the obituary tour I did with them in 2012. And oh, okay. I did all that stuff working with them, and so that, that was another cool thing. Where it was like you know, obituary is such a different animal from monstrosity, and it was very cool being able to like get into their mind of where they're coming from, you know, as yeah. far as coming up to the more simplistic riffs and, and the more basic kind of song structures and just, you know, it was very cool being able to like, you know, because I love Slow We Rot, you know what I mean? Oh, but hell yeah. Of course. Some of the later stuff I kind of like lost touch with just because it, it seemed, you know, kind of more going a straightforward direction and I was kind of more into the crazy speech shit. Right. Yeah. As we are, yeah, we're more, yeah, more, intense, more intense, more crazy, more technical, whatever you want to call it. Absolutely. And so it was kind of cool being able to like really connect with the bitch way and like understand where they're coming from and get into that vibe and like really, right, yeah, man, you know. And uh, so I got to do those shows and we did like four shows in Brazil and a, like show in Ecuador and like this huge show in Santiago, Chile with like. Testament, Anthrax, blah, 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 just all these big bands, right. and blah, 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 Megadeth, it's killer. whatever else, that yeah, was pretty cool, and uh, so it was a good experience, you know, but they needed somebody who could really play leads, you know, and I wasn't like, I'm not that guy, I mean, I'm, I can play <laughs> a little bit of lead, but I can't play like what lead if they're right. the lead guitar position in a visual you know, right. and had it been the rhythm, you know, the rhythms, I, you know, I'm there all day. I thought the rhythm's perfect, you know, great, flawless, you know, but, um, you know, but they just needed a, somebody who could keep up with Ralph as far as leads, you know, and to do that. James Murphy, you know, they want those leads. And, and you know, I'm the first to tell you that I'm not that guy. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> right. <laughs> sure. We saw him back. But, but, you know, it's, but it's, it's all good, man. You know, I'm doing the monstrosity thing, doing the Caraja thing, and, uh, you know, I got a local band that I'm working with to do, like, you know, play cover gigs around here, and that's cool. kind of like a yeah, yeah. job, you know. Um, playing more or less regular music. Uh, sometimes I'm playing bass, sometimes I'm playing drums, sometimes, you know, just depends. Mix it up, man. Doing it all. <laughs> I'm keeping it full, man. I'm keeping my plate full here for sure. Yeah. Well, you'll definitely if you're if you're interested, we'd love to have you back on when the new monstrosity's out. Definitely, man. For awesome, sure. Lee. Thank you so much. This is an honor to have you on. Awesome, brother. Okay, man. I'll be in touch. Take care, man. Take care, man. Thanks, dude. We'll see you, man. Bye, Lee. Be good, brother. Coming soon from Phantasm. Because how do you kill something that can't possibly be alive? Christine. Body by Plymouth. Soul by Satan. Rated R. Watch out for her soon. At a theater near you. Thirteen years ago, audiences across America were horrified by the brutality of a faceless killer. Now, after more than a decade of silence... He has come out of hiding. Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2. Directed by Toby Hooper. Now playing at a theater near you. I've got a message for you. This is the shape of fear. You're not going to like it. This is the color of hell. What is it? And this is the power of the Prince of Darkness. From John Carpenter, director of Halloween. A vision of the most powerful evil of all. Prince of Darkness. Where are you? Rated R. Starts Friday at theaters everywhere.